Hey, everybody, Dr. Z, welcome to the show. Today, I have a really special guest, Andrew Holacek. Um, Andrew, so I was introduced to Andrew by my friend, Johnny Truant, the author who's been on the show, who said, hey, listen, I've been getting into lucid dreaming. I'm writing a book on lucid dreaming and I'm learning more about it. And here's a podcast you have to hear where Andrew was on a podcast talking about lucid dreaming, but then talk, starts speaking about the Tibetan concepts around awakening and all the things that we on our show have been interested in. I listened to the entire thing and then binged a ton of Andrew's stuff. He's an author and a teacher, a retired dentist. I listened to Dream Yoga, his book on the practice of lucid dreaming and beyond using the dream state to actually wake up in the waking state. And I, I mean, I, Andrew, welcome to the show. I gotta say that first. Really a delight to be with you, Zubin. And I have to say from my side, um, I love your energy. I love your passion. And to connect, kind of do a mind meld around these sorts of things is uh, pretty cool stuff. So thanks for the opportunity. You know what just thrills me is that now it's like... It through some blessings that I don't know how I earned, I can reach out to people that I'm fascinated with who are teaching in a way that's very direct and they respond and are kind enough and generous enough and compassionate enough to actually come on the show and talk and share their wisdom. So I'm really glad you're here. Maybe um, talk us through a little bit about your story because it's quite fascinating. Uh, I said a few things, you know, author, spiritual teacher, which is always an uncomfortable phrase to you and to everybody who, who actually teaches the stuff and retired dentist. I mean, how did all this happen yeah, yeah. for you? I have a kind of a labyrinthian um, like flow chart, right? So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess a couple of things are noteworthy when I was really uh, reasonably young in my early, almost preteens, I, I got very interested in the the occult, so-called uh, New Age. The New Age was just barely starting. And I got interested in, in kind of alternate ways, alternative ways of looking at reality. I mean, like clues. I had no idea what I was looking for, but I just simply knew, hey, there's got to be a little bit more to it than this, right? And so I started exploring literature. I started reading whatever was available. And way back then, you know, even in, in the arenas that I have some expertise on now, um, Buddhism, in Hinduism, there was very actually very little literature at the time. So I went to school. I, I got a double degree, and uh, um, I'm actually a concert pianist, so classical piano performance. And uh, I was thinking about med school, and so I got a double degree at that in biology. And then, and then I had this really quite profound metanoia, this really two week ride that irrevocably altered my life. I mean, it's, it's worth saying just a little bit about because it's kind of central to the narrative that we may explore. Fundamentally, what happens even was I was I was working it in an OR, again wanting thinking about going to, into uh, medicine, and I started having all kinds of really interesting dreams, prodromal uh, prodromal dreams, precognitive dreams, dreams of premonition, and then really I, one day I was contemplating. It was just kind of bizarre. I was contemplating this rather obscure law in physics. I mean, go figure, right? Conservation of angular momentum. Still haven't totally figured out why that was the doorway in. And, and my mind just kind of uh, opened and I entered this so-called altered state, which retrospectively, it's not the altered state. I actually saw that as a glimpse of the natural state. This is the altered state. So we can talk more about that later. So I had a glimpse of what I thought maybe um, some dimension of awakening. And over a period of about two weeks, all my dreams were pretty much lucid. I entered a kind of 24 seven awareness, constant lucidity, um, so my dreams became hyper lucid, really clear, completely lucid to them. And the other thing that was really cool, Zubin, is my my day by day, uh, daytime experience became correlatively dreamlike, illusory. And so at first it was like, whoa, this is cool, this is kind of awesome. But after a couple of weeks, it wasn't so awesome anymore because I started losing my footing. It's like WTF is real. I, I I couldn't tell the difference literally between waking state and dream state. They were all the same to me. And so because I didn't have the doctrinal footing, the understanding, I had the experience prematurely. I had the experience before the understanding. I, I basically said, hey, you know, I, what I thought was in originally perhaps a glimpse of awakening was like, hey, this is a glimpse of insanity, right? And so I postscript, I came across the work of R.D. Lang, the really kind of contemplative psychiatrist who Baraka really said, you know, the mystic swims in the same ocean where the psychotic drowns. And so I swam and then I started to drown. So I shut the whole thing down because I really was like, I'm going to go crazy here. So then I entered a really interesting dark night of the soul, which lasted about seven or eight years, 
where it was like, okay, I've, I've had this experience. Uh, what do I do with it? Where do I go with it? And then I started this exploration, a somewhat systematic, rigorous process of elimination, exploration through the world's contemplative traditions. Um, all the while, at this point, I, I, I moved from Michigan to Colorado to study physics because I was, I didn't know it at the time, really, Zubin, but I was looking for reality. And I thought- So, so, yeah. so Andrew, so, I mean, this is, <laughs> I just got to stop you here for a second. Yeah, really. It. It's so, it, it, okay, it started with, you're thinking about angular momentum yeah, in right, physics. Figure, right? Yeah, right. And that rips this hole where you actually have this non-experience. It then leads to a, a, a period of, and when we talk about lucid dreaming, you mean you're actually aware in the dream that you're dreaming. Yeah. And that bled over into reality where reality actually looked illusory. That you not having a container for any of that at this time, you were young and hadn't studied any of this outside of this, uh, led to a kind of a, a destabilization, the so-called dark night that you talk about. And then you embarked on the, the journey to try to figure out what is this? That's exactly, exactly right. So yeah, yeah, totally, that nails it. So then I, I just started looking, looking, and really one day by process of illumination, I started just reading about the Buddhist tradition and just found myself nodding my head all the time. Said, geez, baby, I'm a Buddhist, right? Um, I mean, made so much sense, right? It's biologically Buddha comes from a root that means the awakened one, right? And so right off the bat, it's like, hey, wait a second. This was similar even in name to what I had. I mean, really, we can talk about this later. I, I really look at the Buddha as the ultimate lucid dreamer. So we can take an exploration into how lucidity leads into um, awakening. So, yeah, so I started reading about um, Buddhism, studying it, practicing it. I moved to Colorado, um, Boulder area, where uh, there was a pretty active Tibetan Buddhist scene. Jumped into it um, wholeheartedly, explored it without stop. Um, and then just as a sidebar, you know, I figured I'm not going to be a physicist. That's not really where I want to go. That, that was actually part of the dark night of the soul thing. It was like, hey, I'm, I'm barking up the wrong tree. There's, there's, I'm looking for reality, but this is not the reality that I'm looking for. And so, um, in fact, 40 years later, I look back on, on that pursuit of uh, materialism, physicalism is actually completely antithetical to where I'm really at now, which is a more idealistic world of, you know, made of mind, not matter. And so, um, but I had to do something practical. My whole family was on the medical dental thing. So I figured, heck, I'll, I'll just do this dental thing. And I have to say, it turned out to be a, a profound platform that gave me the freedom to do the things that I wanted to do. But um one of my proudest moments was a graduation. I got the, the gag award, least likely to have dental school interfere with your life award. <laughs> so, I'm actually very proud of that. And so since then, uh, Zubin, I, I've just been really diving in very deeply into unpacking that experience where it's taken me um, into the deep contemplative traditions. My love and passion for science is not abated. If, if I had to do it all over again, neuroscience would probably be my chosen field. Um, so I'm still very active in the study of, of the scientific arts and disciplines, um, but my real kind of heart trajectory is, is just exploring the nature of mind and reality using mediums like the dream arena, meditation, and the like. And so um, I'm still a serious student of the Tibetan tradition, but always remember that the Buddha himself wasn't a Buddhist, right? I mean, he was just an individual who woke up. And like he said, I, I abide by his principle that wherever you find the truth, you will find my dharma. And so I have a, a very fond affinity towards integral approaches. It's like, I don't care who speaks the truth. I'm going to listen. And so I have a deep uh, respect for other non-dual traditions, in particular Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Shaiva Tantra, um, some of the other kind of classic schools. But yeah, that's that got me here where I, I'm now publishing books and I retired um, from my clinical work with COVID that kind of chased me out. And now it's really great. It's been a blessing in disguise because I can devote myself full time to these kinds of pursuits, spending most of my time in retreat or, or writing. So yeah, that, life is good. That's remarkable. You know, and I, I hear this kind of, um, this kind of story from medical professionals like yourself, um, my, my friend, uh, Angelo DeLulo, who's an oh, yeah. anesthesiologist. Oh, yeah. The medicine is kind of the search for truth. It's a, it's a, integrating compassion and these kind of drives that we have. Yeah. But then it, it it has this side effect of giving us the stability or the launching platform, but also the sort of the dukkha, the dissatisfaction. <laughs> You're like, oh, I've done all of this. I've gone through all this. And yet there's still this, either it's a striving or it's a, um, a sense of 
want or lack yeah. or you know pleasure pain loss gain fame shame all the sort of yeah. principles um of 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 how we grasp the mind grasps but it gives you the the stability to say okay now i want to actually explore reality in a in a in a different but but integrated way. And that's why I love your path because it actually has all those elements. And you took a very unusual path towards actually using, and, and unusual meaning it's a little more esoteric, but it's actually quite, it makes a lot of sense using the dream yeah. as a supercharged vehicle to actually wake up in, you know, wake, wake, so-called waking reality. So yeah, yeah. it's pretty remarkable. Have, do, you, do you know a lot of people who are in the medical profession who oh, then- yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Who, who who are like doing this sorts of thing? You mean or? Yeah, yeah. Because I know it's the same thing. Exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, again, it's, it, I agree with your experience. It's not, it's not unusual for people like you and I to um, kind of work in these two different worlds and then use them as platforms into the kind of the irreducible pursuits that I think a lot of people are after. After, because really, I mean, as as far as I've come to look at it. Until you work really directly with your mind, um, everything else is a substitute. And that's why we have this sense of lack. Um, we're basically looking in the wrong direction. I, I, I like the way the Greeks define the term sin. It's hamartia, which means to miss the mark. And so we're constantly missing the mark because we're aiming at the wrong target. And we're always eating the menu instead of the meal. And that's why we have all these levels of obesity epidemic. And hey, look behind me. I'm not immune to this. You know, I, I will I will take Schopenhauer and, and Nietzsche as much as somebody takes burgers and fries, right? I, I gorge on ideologies, thoughts, and, and systems as much as somebody else does on another thing. So I'm very aware of how I work with my deficient sense of emptiness and lack. But what I have noticed over the years, especially through my really long retreats, you know, part of what my training entailed was a very profound experience, the traditional three-year retreat which is where a lot of these practices really came to life for me. And since then, it's like, whoa, the, the word in, in Tibetan is nintig, the heart essence. It's like, hey, let's take a really close look at things. The world is, and again, we can go here. The world is of the nature of mind. I'm always working with my mind. Why not work with my mind in a really direct way? And hence the, what I call the nocturnal meditations. And there are five of them we can talk about, not just lucid dreaming. This is a fantastic kind of uh, uh, concentrated and concentrative and, you know, kind of distilled arena of consciousness where you can work with your mind in a more irreducible fashion. And in fact, parenthetically, this is definitely worth throwing into the mix. In, in most of the world's non-dual wisdom traditions, we in the West have a completely ass backwards where we think the waking state is the only way really to derive insights into the nature of reality. But according to Eastern views, um, much more integral in, 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 in their scope. And really the wake centric lens is actually the most dualistic, the, the most removed from the source of reality. And that's why in Hinduism, they talk about deep dreamless sleep as causal consciousness. So this is really cool stuff. So it's not, again, not just merely lucid dreaming, but also the experience of lucid sleep, maintaining lucidity awareness in deep dreamless formless dimensions. And really like Ramana Maharshi said from the Advaita Vedanta tradition, this is causal consciousness. And he very beautifully, cryptically said, you know, that which does not exist in deep dreamless sleep is not real. And so if you were actually lucid to the deep dreamless state, you were actually most in contact with reality in that state. And then from that state, and there's all kinds of really cool things to say about this, consciousness condenses, contracts, makes, it becomes more reified. We know that as the dream state. And it takes yet another dimension of contraction and reification. We know that is the waking state. And through these wonderful meditative nocturnal arts, we can actually watch this fascinating process of construction and deconstruction that takes place every single night as we fall into sleep and dream. And then every single morning as we come back into so-called waking state, we can see how we construct our self-sense by immediate implication, how we construct the sense of duality and the sense of other and, and therefore, again, just tremendous insights in these um, distilled arenas of consciousness that, that we then take those insights and extrapolate them back into so-called waking reality. So I'll pause for a second to get some um, feedback from you, but there are so many different directions we can take this that goes to the deep end of the pool pretty quickly. So, so this is, okay. And you talked about a lot of this on the other podcast, but I'm gonna unpack a little bit or repack some of what you said. Um, 
with some definitions if I can, and you can interrupt me and correct me where I'm wrong. So in 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 a sense, and and I think Ramana Maharshi pointed at this, this idea that we're most asleep actually to reality in the waking state. And the 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 opposite of that, the deepest you go in sleep is deep, dreamless sleep where you you know some will say oh well, you're oblivious you don't you're not aware is that but that's not true that is the the deepest kind of pure root causal nature of reality one unity thing from which everything else seems to express and actually in the dream state that's one level up you use the term reify meaning at each level we make real we make solid the expressions of this you know deep dreamless sleep mind uh, that I think in in Tibetan, uh, in the Tibetan tr tradition is called the clear light mind. And as it expresses in the dream, that's one level of reification. It's still a little illusory feeling. Then we get to what we think is waking gross reality where things are stable and independent and solid, but that is not true. <laughs> that can be seen through. And our entire physicalist worldview that I think a lot of scientists have and so on, that everything is stuff and we emerge consciousness, it may actually be backwards, that everything yeah. is mind. Yep. And, and so did I unpack that correctly? Yes, you know, you have a wonderful um, capacity to synthesize that way. That's spot on. And um, even Matthew Walker, I mean, he's a, a really hard-nosed, straight-laced neuroscientist, wrote a wonderful book called Why We Sleep. And in this book, he says two things that are worth sharing briefly. Uh, one is he says, and we can talk about this later about like, well, okay, these nocturnal meditations are sort of cool, but like, why bother? Well, here's one reason. Matthew says it's entirely, almost verbatim, it's entirely possible that lucid dreamers represent the next iteration in Homo sapiens evolution. And so we can come back to that because like, why should we do this? There's some really interesting hard, hard neuroscientific data about this. The second thing that, that Matthew says that I thought was really beautiful he goes on this riff basically saying from a Western perspective that, hey, maybe we've really got it all backwards here. Like we have to, we have to go to sleep to repair physiologically. You know this as a doctor. We have to go to sleep to repair every, all the damage that takes place by our activities during the day. And so what Matthew argues in a really radical, courageous way is that, hey, maybe we really do have it backwards. Maybe the waking, uh, the dream, deep dreamless state is the foundational state. And from that, we have this epiphenomenal epigenetic display. And so there's a lot of footing with this sort of thing. And, and it's helpful for people to know about this because, again, it can strengthen one's view of like, okay, why should, why should I bother with these nocturnal meditations? It's interesting. We, uh, in my playful language, we have this kind of do not disturb sign when it comes to sleep and dream, right? <clears throat> you can rouse me from my um, slumber using meditative techniques during the day but don't mess with me when I sleep, right? Because that's really actually where that is, where ego as a, as a form of arrested development goes to recharge its samsaric batteries. I, I think your listeners know what samsara is, right? The, the confused dimension of duality. And so so th this world, this world of, of, of um, uh, uh, this where we think things are solid and real and all that, that's samsara, as opposed to what nirvana yeah, exactly. Nirvana literally, it's a term of negation, literally means extinction, as it as similar to niroda, which means cessation. These are terms of negation that negate these, these fundamentally dualistic ways of looking at the world. And so another way to talk about it, different kind of languaging angle, is that when you drop into deep, dreamless, formless sleep, you're dropping into non-duality. And that's why we as an ego, exclusive identification with form, embedded in duality, do not recognize it. But absence of awareness is not awareness of absence, where the ego just simply can't, it recognizes things that arise in awareness, not foremost awareness itself. And that's why when things are taken away, ego basically in thought bubble says, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. So it literally goes unconscious. But for someone who does the meditations and the training, they can maintain a 24-7 lucidity. Literally, they have their awareness is on 24-7. And they maintain this lucidity through all these states. And then by uh, extension, according to the wisdom traditions, the same proficiency, if you believe in this sort of thing, can help you in what they talk about is the dream at the end of time, which is death. So we can talk a little bit about how that applies in, in the fruitional level. But one more level, it happens every single bloody moment. Every time you get lost in distraction, 
this is a reiterated phenomenology of what we're just talking about here. And that, so that's what makes this stuff so bloody cool. It's like, uh, it's like studying a fractal, right? So we're using awareness as it manifests in, in sleep and dream as a way to understand the arising, abiding, and cessation of, of any phenomenal moment, thought, experience altogether, the arising of a day, a life, or in even cosmological terms, according to some traditions, the arising, abiding, cessation of an entire cosmos. The philosophers talk about it as the theory of recapitulation, that this is an iterative phenomenology. And you, you can therefore, and this is what makes it so cool, you can therefore use the diurnal correlates, your daily meditations, as a way to support this, the nighttime thing. You can use that to help you prepare for the bardos, the uh, thanatological approach. And you therefore kind of triangulate, you, you have all these different bootstrap mechanisms going on between all these different iterations of mind that help you understand the play of mind through all these different dimensions. And, and I'll pause for a second, but this is the way I actually define dream. Dream is just code language for manifestation of mind. And so we are in a dream all the time, whether we know it or not. And that in fact is what lucidity is. If you know it, that's being lucid. If you're fully lucid, that's a Buddha. If you're partially lucid, that's a lucid dreamer. And so uh, this stuff is just so great. I mean, it just ties in in all these different dimensions. It has a lot of cash value. It's not just this armchair philosophizing or meditative rhetoric. This stuff has immediate and profound implications and applications to everything we do. <laughs> <sighs> Man, okay, all right. There's a lot. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Like, okay. oh. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so here, here let, me, let me see if I can recap some of this from a slightly different angle because it's it it is the central excitement of this for me too is this idea that that in deep dreamless sleep we think we're extinct and the we that thinks we're extinct is this pattern of energy of thought going to thought going to thought this identification with form called ego and ego cannot wrap its egoic head around a non a non object like formless awareness <laughs> that exists in deep sleep. So, so it it feels like it turns off, it goes unconscious, it has no memory of it. And it but, but what's strange is you can wake up in the morning and someone can ask you, did you sleep well? And you'll say yes or no, which implies there's some continuity of experience. So you're not going extinct in deep dreamless sleep. There's a continuity there, but you're not, like you said, lucidity is the, is the knowing that you're still there or the awareness of awareness, uh, it's, it's not getting lost in form or lost in thought to thought to thought to thought to thought, which in itself is kind of a definition of a dream That's when we go from thought to thought. That is moment to moment non-lucidity, Zubin. And just, I have to throw this in. This is precisely why we're so good. We're naturals in non-lucid dreams is because we're non-lucid to the contents of our mind all the time. <laughs> So we are actually, we're practicing non-lucidity, whether we know it or not, every time we get hooked up, swept away in discursive thinking. And look at your own mind. How often does that happen? Like tens of thousands of times? It's like Kabir said of death. What is found now is found then. And so immediately this throws in the mix the unbelievable importance of the diurnal practices, the daily meditations, and how studies have shown that meditators have more lucid dreams. In the mind of a meditation master, there is no such thing as a non-lucid dream. In the mind of a complete master, they don't even dream anymore. I mean, that that level of expression has been completely eradicated. So anyway, I cut you off a little bit, but um no, that, so that actually that that reminds me of the point I wanted to make, which is there are practitioners of I, I call them the dark arts because oh, they yes. happen at night. Right. Yeah, like <laughs> but there are there are those practitioners who are are quite awake and are able to maintain that awareness throughout the night, meaning they really don't sleep in that sense. Um, their body stops there and they're in the different stages of sleep, right? They're going through stage one, two, three, four, five, REM sleep, et cetera, but they're fully aware the entire time. So to the extent that they, they extinguish awareness, extinguish the apparent awareness, that doesn't happen, right? They're That's actually right. awake. And, they, and they're putting people in labs that, that they're now substantiating this. I had a conversation with Thomas Metzinger, who's one of the great theoretical, he calls himself a theoretical philosopher. The guy's bloody brilliant, right? And we've been discussing this because he did a landmark study on what, what he calls minimal phenomenal experience, which is their languaging for this. 
And he, he said, and I completely agree, he said, you know, when we can substantiate this in the laboratory, this is a revolution in the mind sciences, because this is, this is, a, this is how paradigms get busted. When you get data that just doesn't fit the old paradigm. And so they dismissed lucid dreaming until 75 and 77, when Keith Hearn and Stephen LaBerge proved it. That was a huge revolution. And now there's some really interesting labs, and I'm in contact with these people studying minimal phenomenal experience, i.e. lucidity and deep dreamless sleep. And so the couple of things you pinged out here um, worth talking about. One is that, again, the right view in the so-called West, we have a kind of light switch model of consciousness, right? Um, yes, no, on, off, dead, alive, black, white, this kind of binary approach. And that's basically what happens. You know, you wake up in the morning, you fall asleep at night, slip, a light switch on and off. Well, what these practices do, my languaging, is they replace the Western light switch with an Eastern dimmer. And so it's not, yes, no, black, white, dead, dead alive. No, it's gross to subtle to very subtle. And so you're leaving a few photons of awareness on as your mind transitions with full lucidity, as you said, from the gross waking state into the subtle dream state, and then into the causal deep dreamless state. And then um, at the very beginning, you said something that also I want to come back to briefly about why it is that we don't recognize these deep states. Well, it's a little bit, um, Trungpa Rinpoche famously said it, and you were heading this direction, ego can't attend its own funeral. And so ego ego is a form-based level of, of um, developmental arrest, fundamentally. Ego is exclusive identification with form. Well, when you're transitioning from form to semi-formless, that's the dream, to fully formless, the dreamless day, how does ego relate to that? Well, it doesn't. It's a death threat to ego. Ego doesn't relate to it because ego is exclusive identification with form. So this is why the untamed, untrained, loud, gross, dualistic mind shouts over or stampedes over these extremely subtle dimensions of mind. But hey, guess what? Silence, stillness meditate, these natural qualities are evoked. And so this begs the, uh, leads to one very important interjection. There's two ways to look at training in this stuff, Zubin. One is completely valid provisional way of effort. And we can talk all about like the techniques, the methodologies, the things you can do, lucid dreaming, dream yoga to attain lucidity, completely valid. But, and this is the big difference between lucid dreaming and dream yoga. Because lucid dreaming does not have this following approach. Dream yoga, this is key. The other approach, which is actually more valid, I intimated it a bit earlier, is that lucidity is actually the natural state. Non-lucid dreams are the, we've been trained into non-lucidity. And so on one level, I say this because people can hear some of the stuff and be a little maybe in, uh, in daunted, intimidated. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, I'll never be able to attain these sorts of things. Well, honestly, the only thing you have to do is just open and relax. And these natural qualities just unfold. And what happens when you sleep? You open and relax. I mean, if you didn't do that, you wouldn't fall asleep. So that naturally takes place as you fall asleep. What do the meditative arts do? Exactly that. Meditation, my favorite definition, is habituation to openness. Opening the aperture of your consciousness, your mind, your heart. So that in a real way, you're, you let in more light, more lucidity, more awareness. So the, another image I give Zubin is like, Hey, you know, we, you're in your studio. I'm in my room. Let's just saturate this room with light, right? Just saturate it with light. And let's say it's dark outside. Ah, it's getting stuffy in here. I'm going to go outside, take a break, step outside. You can't see shit, right? I mean, your, your, your pupils are so, interesting metaphor, right? Your pupils are so contracted. They're so constricted. You can't see anything. But, hey, we all know it. What do you do? You wait. You're patient. You relax. Your pupils dilate. Your awareness dilates, your consciousness dilates. And then guess what? You start to see all this stuff that has always been there in the so-called unconscious mind. It's just been lost in artificial light. And so that's another way to look at it. It's just on one level, open, relax, and you'll start to see things that you've never seen before. It's a little bit like, you know, daytime, you look outside, you can't see the thousands and actually billions of stars that are out there. Why? Because they're you're lost in, in the flooding of, of, in this case, uh, real light. But so turning down the light, turning within, looking within gives you this tremendous access to these foundational states of mind. And last thing before I toss it back your direction, 
one of the reasons these practices are so transformative in, in the tantras, they say the practices you do in, in uh, dream yoga, let alone sleep yoga, sleep yoga is even more transformative, are seven to nine times more efficacious and transformative than what you do in the waking state. Why? Well, because you're working with the tectonic plates of your experience or you're working with the roots of the mind. And so what you do with the roots changes everything that flowers in daily experience. And so this is another reason, like, why should you be bothered? Well, you can really, it's like hyper-pedagogical approach. You can really ex accelerate your psycho-spiritual evolution by engaging in these practices for some of the reasons I, I mentioned in the last 20 minutes. You know, you're working with really refined, distilled foundational dimensions of mind, the expression of which is this phenomenal world. And so, hey, life is short. What's the, how does the maxim go? You can't add more years to your life, but you can add more life to your years. So this is a way to add more life to your years and maintain lucidity um, in the dream state and then with some proficiency even in the deep dreamless state. <laughs> so anyway, that's why I get yeah. to this stuff. Man, I, uh, so, okay. So this, <laughs> this um, synergy between daytime practices of meditation, which is that opening and receptivity, the, the kind of um, being able to dilate your pupil so that you can see more clearly what's happening in any present moment. You're more awake, you're more uh, lucid in the day because normally we are asleep. And I, I, it's, it's interesting, I, this is a little side note. One interesting practice that I discovered in my meditative practice kind of serendipitously was, uh, um, is this practice of watching the mind opening to a dilated uh, attention and watching for thoughts to arise. And then what I do is I actually associate thought with a dream. Oh, nice. So I'll actually wow. label the thought as, oh, dreaming. And then another thought will come dreaming. Then a, a, actually a, a overlay a face, like the, the, the thought that there's a face here looking out, oh, that's part of a dream, what's, what's dreaming? And look for that. And that awake presence that's actually uh, experiencing the thoughts and all that feels so different. It feels awake and open and spacious and relaxed. And then thoughts start to feel like the dream state, which was a very powerful insight for me because I said, oh, this is what it means to be asleep while we're walking through the day is we're lost in thought. Yep. That's one manifestation. And the other one is really getting lost in what you were talking about a little bit earlier, my languaging, the, the unholy trinity, seeing the world as solid, lasting, and independent, i.e. dualistic. So if you want to know, this is very interesting. We can do a real quick test. Do you want to know whether you're awake or asleep in the spiritual sense? Look around you and ask yourself, do I see the things around me as, as being solid, lasting, and independent, i.e. dualistic? Almost everybody listening is going to say, yeah, that's a given. That's axiomatic. Well, if you see the world that way, that's the myth of the given. That's what it means to be asleep. So this is another really interesting differentiation between lucid dreaming and dream yoga, because when you're uh, practicing for lucidity and classic lucid dreaming, you work with what are called dream signs. And this is worth throwing into the mix because dream signs, we all have had them. They're just, it's just a weird crap that happens in your dream that if you take it at face value, you just stay lost in lucidity. Hey, a pink elephant just walked into my room. And what's the big deal, right? You stay asleep. So in classic lucid dreaming, you work with, with dream signs, which would be just any anomalous experiences that happen. You know, we're sitting here doing this talk and like a like, you know, bird flies across or something. Well, that's really weird. Then you conduct what's called a state check. Um, many ways to do that, but one is just you just jump up. So we'll quick a uh, uh, real quick uh, lucid dreaming um, tip and trick here. If you jump up whenever anything weird happens. Well, why are you doing that? Well, to create a pattern so that when that yeah, there you go. So or exactly. So when everything something weird is happening. <laughs> there you go. So you do you condition yourself to do it here. Guess what? What is found now is found then. You're going to start doing the same thing in your dream. Pink elephants going to appear in your dream. You're going to do a state check. But instead of you and me just coming back down, well, what's going to happen? Most of the time, you just keep going, right? Ah. It's like, hey, wait a second. I'm either tripping, dreaming, or dead. And so that's that's a dream sign. But here's the kicker. In this arena, in lucid dreaming, we just did a, we conducted a state check. We come back. We landed. We're here. Solid, lasting, independent. Ah, I'm awake. Ah, uh, you may be awake in the world of lucid dreaming but you're still asleep in the world of dream yoga because if you still take this to be real, that's a mistake. 
And so basically, this is where it gets so bloody interesting. The very dream signs we use to confirm that we're dreaming in the world of lucid dreaming become the dream signs that proclaim to you that you're sleeping in the world of dream yoga. And so look around you right now. You see the world dualistically? Of course I do. Is there any other way? Yes, there is. It's called ultimate lucidity. That's a dream sign. And so you realize, oh my gosh, I, I really am asleep. I mean, that's, and this is exactly what the Buddha woke up from and what he woke up to. He woke up from the nightmare of a reified dualistic reality. He woke up from that nightmare scene to what? He woke up to a reality that is in fact dreamlike, empty, emptiness. So this is where the whole sophisticated doctrine on emptiness comes into play because everything in dream yoga, arguably everything in the Buddhist arena, circumambulates the central teaching of emptiness. So before we go into that stuff, I'll pause for a second to see if, if this is uh, landing with you or you want to take it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, uh... Yeah, I mean, I don't. I, we probably lost ninety-seven percent of the audience, but I have. I have to say, I, we'll bring them back. But because this is the central thesis here, this is the central thesis of reality in general. And I've heard you talk about this before in terms of having X-ray vision. It, it, it's in the sense that what what we presume here is a solid thing that is lasting. In other words, it persists. It's a thing in and of itself and it's independent, it's separate. And when you use the term non-duality, I wanna dig into that a little because I, people, some people aren't as familiar with the terminology, meaning a subject and an object in a world of objects, you're the subject. Non-duality is, is saying, no, they're not two. They're actually the, the one in the, it, very difficult to talk about, but this idea of now, waking up from the dream that there are solid, separate, and independent objects in a world, and you're a subject navigating that world, to the reality that these are vibrating appearances coming out of, again, what the Buddhists describe as emptiness, which is a very difficult thing to talk about, that, that ultimate reality is that kind of clear mind of emptiness that emerges these appearances that are ephemeral, impermanent, not solid, and not separate. They are self-experiencing, self-aware. Uh, they don't need a subject to, to experience them. I, am I even coming close to- Oh, that's spot on. I mean, you, again, you have this wonderful um, capacity to distill and to integrate. That's actually spot on. And, and if you want, sometime during the course of our, our work together, so that this isn't left as just spirit, you know, mere rhetoric, uh, we can close our eyes. I can guide your listeners. It takes like four minutes. I can actually guide your listeners through a type of contemplation that if you really work with this and sink your um, teeth into it, this can really change the way you look at the world. It's a way to give people some little exercise contemplation to have them experience this sort of thing, because that's where, that's where the real cash value is, is when you take these seemingly philosophical approaches. And we talked about this earlier before we came on that it's only philosophy because we haven't experienced it yet. None of this is philosophy. This is a description of reality. And it just may seem distant and, and somewhat um, inaccessible simply because we're so conditioned, trained in non-lucidity and seeing the world in these dualistic ways. It's you know this consensual hallucination that Neil Seth talks about, right? We're all victims to this consensual hallucination that we call the dualistic world. And that's why you get rogues like you and me and others who start like Socrates, got Socrates killed. It won't get us killed, but it may get us ostracized, right? Where we start to question authority. We start to overthrow the tyranny of appearance. We start to question things. And hey, when does this usually happen, Zuman? When everything falls apart, when somebody dies or you lose a job or you get cancer. This is when people often, right? often start to look for alternative descriptions of reality. Why? Because truth is rearing its head. The impermanent nature, that's emptiness, may seem somewhat um, abstract initially, but its expression is not. Impermanence is the lived expression of emptiness. And so when an expression of emptiness arises, some, something disappears, somebody dies, whatever, you're rattled to the core. It's like, wait, whoa, 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 wait a second. What's really going on here? And so therefore, again, armed with the right view, these opportunities, so-called obstacles, become the most powerful opportunities. Instead of trying to get Humpty Dumpty back together again, let Humpty Dumpty fall apart. Maybe that'll allow an opportunity for openness, 
truth, real news, not fake news to come in. And then opportunities to really explore like, like what it is that you're really after. And so again, for cash value on this, oh my gosh, you know, if you really work with this material, this is like, uh, this is Marie Kondo, not just for your closet. This is Marie Kondo for your life. It will simplify everything. I mean, you're not just going to clean out your closet. You're going to clean out your mind. <laughs> you're going to clean out everything because you realize these are all substitute gratifications. I'm eating the menu instead of the meal. So I keep coming back to that because this stuff is like, sometimes Buddhism is referred to as a transcendental pragmatism. This stuff is unbelievably practical. It will save you so much time and trouble. It will save you a ton of money, a ton of heartache, and it will allow you to live your life in the most radically simplistic ways Allowing you to discover that, as my friend Rupert Spire says, you are the happiness that you seek. Everything you want, you already have. You just have to become lucid to it. And so this stuff, yeah, on first hearing, it's like, oh, yeah, whatever. Oh, my goodness. It has so much practicality and applicability. And that's why I get jazzed about it. It's like, whoa, you can bring this into your street value. life. You can bring the street level into your life right here, right now and live a life with much greater authenticity and happiness and, you know, just joy. Absolutely. Now, okay, <laughs> l- let me ask a question because this okay. often comes up when we talk about, by the way, Rupert is wonderful. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him in Berkeley and uh, he's a fantastic teacher, non-dual teacher. Um, when we talk about this idea that things are impermanent, that they're appearances uh, and that they're kind of self-perceiving appearances and nothing is um, solid and so on, the, 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 the egoic mind, especially the Western mind, sees that as nihilism. So meaning if you have that insight, this now means that you have license to do whatever you want, go shoot up a school, go and stop working, uh, whatever you want, because none of it matters because it's all ephemeral. It's all an appearance. None of it's real. Morality goes out the door and you can just sit in a cave or not. It doesn't matter because there's no meaning in anything. How do you think about that in yeah. the course of what well, you're I'm saying? I'm so glad you brought that up because this is really important. Um, you know, there are near friends and near enemies to every quality, right? And so wherever you find light, you will find shadows. So a near enemy of this proclamation that reality is illusory and dreamlike in nature, I mean, in our languaging, when we say something like it's just a dream, that's a pejorative statement. It's a dismissive negating statement. And so what you're pointing out here is super important. It's not nihilism. If, if, if you fall into the trap of nihilism, that's a raging misunderstanding, and that's a colossal trap and near enemy of this. But what it is, is it's nihilistic. In other words, it's negating to all our previous reified ways of looking at the world. And that's what gets challenged here. But fundamentally, if, if you explore these topics properly, that's the only thing that's negated. Illusion is negated. Ignorance is negated. Fake news is negated. And then what's revealed, what's discovered from that is real news, the truth, reality. And so it's only nihilistic when when these teachings are not um, understood properly. Yes, from an egoic perspective, hey, this is no day at the beach. Because especially when you work with lucid sleep, this is is a a kind of a death threat to the ego for for the reasons that we mentioned before. Because we're dealing with formless dimensions of mind. Ego is exclusive identification with form. Again, how does ego slash form relate to formlessness in two ways? One, it doesn't. Secondly, if it does, fear, fear. And so this is this is where the integral approach, Ruben, uh, Ruben comes in, so important. This is the, the fear thing is such a big deal on the spiritual path. And so let's talk about this a little bit because on, on the evolutionary path, right? Thanks to Darwin and Lamarck and everybody else, we need fear. If, if we didn't have fear, we wouldn't be here talking about the nature of fear. We'd be a chicken McNugget on the Serengeti, right? There's no way. (laughs) So we need fear to provisionally differentiate self and other. Fear protects form. Okay, so now we go from from, uh, material to spiritual trajectories or vectors of evolution. Well, then what do we do with this biological legacy that's literally hardwired into our system? The the very fear that is designed to protect form When we are trying to go from form to formless, how does ego relate to that? With tremendous fear. Because it's a death threat to the ego. And so therefore, you need this transcend but include approach to things like fear. We need fear. Oh my gosh, don't get rid of your fear. In fact, don't get rid of your ego. 
you need your ego to communicate as skillful means as a way to relate to others. Like when you're talking to a two-year-old, you stoop down to talk to your two-year-old. Same, you still have access to the ego. But this is important because when you're dealing with, with deep meditation, death, this deeply connects to that, or these nocturnal meditations, sooner or later, fear is going to rear its head. And this creates a very interesting kind of internal conflict of interest because part of us, the so-called more evolved aspects, the ultraviolet dimensions of our being, listening to this podcast, engaging in psycho-spiritual development and evolution, that sort of thing. We want this stuff. We want to wake up. But we have this massive devolutionary caboose back here that doesn't want anything to do with it. And depending on how powerful that tail is that continues to wag the dog, right? that will very um, effectively deter you from real deep spiritual practice. And so the reason I mention this is because if, you're, if you are a serious practitioner, sooner or later, you're going to come up against a membrane of fear. And if you relate to it properly, it is a really good sign. It means you're actually starting to get towards the truth. You're, you're entering the gauntlet that leads to truth. And uh, I say this for really practical reasons, because when I've done really, really long retreats, Somewhat akin to what happened in, in the experience I shared at the outset of our conversation when I started to freak out. I mean, there were moments where fear was like, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to die here. No, you're not. These are just growing pains. You're going to die, let go of, transcend the ego. It just feels like you're going to lose your mind. You're going to lose your egoic mind to find reality. And so if you understand that, when fear comes up, really good marker. Hey, I'm starting to get somewhere. So. <laughs> This is good stuff. I, 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 I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I have to say, since I've like kind of turbocharged how much I meditate and since, since a retreat we did recently and fear comes up a lot. And I got to say this, I was listening to your dream yoga uh, audiobook, cool. and there's a section that I'm sure we'll talk about on illusory form. In other words, the practices during the day of looking at waking reality and noticing the dreamlike aspects of it and actually kind of really highlighting them almost sometimes in an artificial way, but it's a kind of fake it till you make it, you call it where you're kind of, you know, going, okay, well, if this is like a dream, what would it look like? And one of the practices you pointed out, and I may have even misunderstood it because I was listening half in a, in a meditative state, um, was reverse blinking. So eyes are closed and you just do very quick blinks of reality. And so I was doing that in my meditation chair in my office, listening to your thing, I had to pause the thing because it became so clear to me that this was a dream that I started to panic, not, not just panic. I found myself on the ground curled up in a ball, like tears coming down going, oh my God, like none of this is real. And, and I had to stop. And I was like, okay, this is, I'm clearly touched onto something here, <laughs> but it was terrifying. Oh, that's awesome. Too, so can I ask you a question? So yes. I'm, I'm curious when you had this experience, if you can uh, remember it, can you actually touch into uh, what was happening both cognitively and somatically? What, I'm really curious, like what, what was happening within you that was generating this? Because this is gonna lead to some really interesting stuff. So, so it, you know, and I'm remembering as best I can because it was a sensation. It was more like a visceral sensation. I'll say this, there were two components. One was a, a witnessing perception of, oh, look what my body's doing. Like I'm curled up in fear and like like screaming. Uh, luckily no one was home. And then there was a, a, a an interesting part of me that was watching thoughts going, oh, that reverse blinking exercise must be really destabilizing. So there's a thought. And then there's the overall perception of, oh, you know, this is probably a, 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 a fear response that I've heard talked about before. So there were these different levels of mind that were happening simultaneously, but the embodied somatic aspect of it was the most dramatic because it was like, almost like the body said, enough, stop, no, you don't need to see this. It, oh my God, that's just spot on. I mean, this, this leads to some really cool stuff. So just a couple of things. When you do this exercise that I point out, the practice of a loose reform, part of it is in fact, this kind of blinking thing and, and moving your head in jerky ways. It's completely sophomoric and like, whatever. It's like, are you kidding me? But it, it has the effect of what you talk about. It, it actually works to deconstruct our visual sense field and, and creates a sense of the illusory nature of continuity. That reality is quantized, reality is pixelated. We're the ones that literally scientists call it flicker fusion. 
through the speed of our mind, we're the ones that super glue reality through the velocity of our mind to create the illusion of continuity and narrative structure, which is exactly what ego does and what ego is. And so when you do this exercise and others, what are you doing? You're, you're breaking that up. You're, you're kind of challenging this automaticity. So it's, a pro, it's actually a, a practice of de-automatization, kind of challenging the status of continuity, realizing, oh my gosh, my, my, my entire world is actually highly discontinuous. One second, I'm thinking, hearing, smelling, tasting. These are discrete moments of consciousness. In fact, in, in Buddhist Abhidharma, psychology of mind, these are distinct minds. It's not one mind. Every moment, a new mind comes up. And so we are the ones, we slash ego, out of fear that super glue this together. We're running around with little caulking guns to keep all the holes intact, right? So that we can create this illusion that we all have it together. Well, good luck with that, right? And that's what happens when things fall apart. You start to realize the discontinuous nature. And so what I wanted, the reason I mentioned this to you is, again, this is something you can start to feel when, um, the reason I mentioned this, I'm writing two books on this topic right now, Zubin, where um, this, this combustion cycle of the path that is really an alternating current of openness and contraction. And so this is, oh, this is, there's so much to say here, but I invite people to take a very close look. Again, this is something you can feel. Once you're sensitized to this, you can feel it. And parenthetically, I mentioned the Buddha as the awakened one. Sometimes the root B-U-D-H also translated as the opened one. So Buddhas are the opened ones. We, in contradistinction, confuse sentient beings. Me, that's the demo here today. Contracted. Oh, I'm so contracted. And so what happens in moments like your experience or deep meditation or whatever, we relax, we open, we actually make contact with reality. And in that brief moment of opening, if we can do so without reference, we realize, oh my gosh, it's a massive moment of tremendous orgasmic release. But then what happens, just like you said, ego has not been exhausted. So that narrative bandwidth, that that momentum, karma, whatever term you want to use, that habit pattern comes roaring back in to say something like, wait a second, what about me, (laughs) right? Where do I fit into this? Well, you don't, right? There's no (laughs) place for personal identity in the space. And so guess what happens? You automatically, reflexively, biologically, you contract out of fear. And interesting that you went to the floor, curled up into a little ball, even your asana, was representative of that contraction. And so here's where it gets really deep. We think that we're contracting. So uh, how can I best say this? When we open, we're actually making contact with reality in this alternating cycle of openness. We make contact with reality. If we didn't do that, even on, on a kind of provisional level, we couldn't walk across the street. So there has to be some level of contact with reality to even function in this world. Um, Catatonic, schizophrenic, I mean, really extreme contracted states of mind. You realize that sometimes incredible self-consciousness will give you some sense of how when you're super contracted, you can't even move, like the anti-zone state. But here's where it gets really interesting. So we make contact with reality, we open to it, we do this tens of thousands of times a day, we're doing it right now. Opening to reality, gathering information, and then through automaticity, referencing, bringing it back. And here's the kicker. In an unexamined way, and what, is, what did uh, Plato say? Unexamined life is not worth living. In an unexamined way, we think we're contracting or referring back to something, me. No, no, appearance is not in harmony with reality. We're contracting onto nothing. That's <laughs> the emptiness thing. We're contracting onto formless awareness itself. It is the contraction itself that generates the illusion that there is a self. Hence, self equals contraction. Colloquial translation, self equals grasping. So every time you contract grasp, which you do a quadrillion times a day, this is the heartbeat of the ego. And we do it all the time to keep this ridiculous thing called ego alive. And so once we slow down, pause, open, We start to see this entire process take place. We see the role of meditation in this process of de-automatization. 
And then we start to open, 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 and free ourselves from these massive forces of the dark side, all these habituated contraction, contractive mechanisms that basically create all the suffering in the world. And so let's take a really extreme example. You get someone like Putin. You know, I mean, like how on earth can someone do what this, he's not even a man, he's like subhuman. How can he do what he's doing? It's because he's so contractive. He's so megalomaniacal. He's such a solid entity. It's the antithesis of love, right? I mean, he's so contracted. There's no sense of caring. There's no sense of whatever. And so these particular fundamental principles have tremendous explanatory power in in us understanding why people do the things that they do from these deep fundamental psycho-spiritual principles. And again, I keep throwing this stuff up there because this stuff has a lot of traction in real world, even, even political circles. You can take the vast array of the complexities of the world's problems right now, and I promise you, you can reduce them to these fundamental principles. I mean, no doubt whatsoever. So, No, no doubt whatsoever at all. That's exactly right. If, if you saw reality as it was, the kind of things we see happening in the world that we call problems, would they would evaporate <laughs> very rapidly. And, you know, so, oh, there's so much there. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. The, the, this idea that you're contracting onto an illusion, you're actually contracting onto a, an energetic pattern of, 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 of self-experiencing phenomena. And you can actually experience that in meditation and out of meditation. You can feel back into the self, look for it and realize, oh, there's it's vapor <laughs> and it's coming from you know nothing and going into nothing and yet there's a radiant fullness to it that is paradoxically also true and it 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 is you use the word love that's unconditional love and con- infinite contact and acceptance of everything and it might be a good might be a good pivot into the into the unexamined lucid dream state yeah. where you're awake in the dream but it's kind of like, oh, I'm dreaming. I'm going to do what I want. So like, you've described it as the best home entertainment system right, ever. Right. <laughs> oh, I can fly. I can, you know, have an orgy. I can do all these things because I know I'm dreaming and I know there's no consequences. But I still know that. Yeah. I am still a contracted self navigating a world of objects that I somehow know I'm creating, but it's still a separation. There's not a real spiritual advancement there. It's just a kind of, in fact, you've, you've mentioned it, it creates a kind of cause and effect that if, if done incorrectly can actually have consequences in the real in the real world, yeah? Totally, yes, exactly. So several things there. Yeah, this is one reason the classic um, lucid dreaming is a little bit sexy and it sells. I mean, you know, you read some of the advertising, you know, fulfill your wildest fantasies in the privacy of your own mind, right? Well, what it doesn't say in the really small print is these practices are not karmically tax-free, right? So, <laughs> so wherever intention is involved, habit pattern slash karma is created. It doesn't matter if it's in a dream. And so this is good or bad news. It's really bad news if you go in there and do all these crazy things, which a lot of people do, you know, the whatever, use your imagination. It's like the myth of Gyges, you know, where the, the guy becomes blind, I'm not blind, invisible. And then it, it's, a, 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 I think, a Plato, right? Um, the story about how um, this guy feels like he can get away with anything. Like, what would you do if you were invisible? In the nighttime, not a lucid dreaming thing allows you to discover that. I mean, people usually do what Gaides did. You kill the king and rape the queen and do all the super samsaric stuff. Well, using the principles of neuroplasticity, right? You know this. Whatever you do with your mind changes your brain. It doesn't even just change your brain. It changes your body. And so you're in there doing this stuff. And whether you know it or not, it is changing you. So that's the so-called bad news. But transforming obstacle into opportunity Good news is, whoa, 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 I can create bad karma, break bad habit patterns in my dream. I can clean them up. And so this is where dream yoga really comes in. Because if you go into these dream states properly, you can purify a heap of bad habit patterns, karma. That's the whole purpose. And so you're in there watching your mind display itself. And in fact, the moniker for dream yoga is the measure of the path. Your dreams will show you where you stand. 
And so they're, they're marvelously revelatory practices. They're prescriptive and diagnostic. And they allow you these tremendous opportunities every single night. I mean, this is a month, a year, six years in the course of an average life. This is just on the dream state, right? You can get a PhD in less than six years, right? Imagine becoming lucid in the state, how much you can do. You can purify in the literature. Zubin is replete with the stuff in one dream, one like a near-death experience because it's so foundational. One hyperlucid dream, a dream that's more real, more vibrant than this, it can change the, the trajectory of your entire life. And so, I th- again, I throw this back into the mix because, whoa, whoa, I had no idea lucid dreaming dream yoga had this much potential. Maybe I'm going to look into this. Maybe there's a way I can extend lucidity, awareness, life into this dimension of, of my um, experience. It is, pre- you know, otherwise just pretty much unconscious. And so, yeah, I'll pause and come up for air around that, but. <laughs> oh, man. So, okay. All right. A few things here. Okay. One is this idea of karma, which we're going to do a whole separate show on because it's so misunderstood in the West, this idea. You use the term habit energy or habit pattern. I think that's very Western accessible. This idea that in the world of appearances, there is this law of cause and effect that what you what happens actually affects other things and things happen for reasons uh, in this world. And so even in your mind, if you're having a lucid dream, you're awake, you know you're dreaming and you go out and commit murder and have you know rape and all these terrible things, there is an energy or a pattern of cause and effect that actually uh, uh, ripples out. And the opposite, like you said, there's the opportunity is in that dream, which is supercharged, maybe because you're closer to the foundation of reality, that deep causal dreamless sleep, than you are in the waking state. Everything you do in the dream world, it's like in the movie Inception, it's like somehow magnified <laughs> in significance. Um, and and because you can actually purify, you can, you can change habit pattern, you can, and that may be the yoga part of what you're talking about, this idea of transformation. And, and, and I will say this, this, um, actually, no, I'll tell the story later, but I'll bounce it back to you because that's the power of this practice. It's not just for going out and debauching. In fact, that may be not a good thing. And one quick thing I'll say, when I was younger, I would have intermittent, spontaneous lucid dreams. And, and, and so what, what, what would happen is I'd be in these situations where I could do pretty nasty, terrible things and something always stopped me. And I would wake up regretting that something stopped me because I was like, that was a dream. I could have done X or Y or whatever. And, and I didn't because there's a part of me that's like, that's wrong. You can't do that. And uh, I was so upset in the waking state. I'm like, I could have gotten away with anything. And uh, now I'm starting to think back and go, you know, that was probably good. It was probably uh, good that I didn't engage that karmically in that way. But yeah, b- back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Right on. And, and who knows, that could have been a, an upper bandwidth of your identity. And, and so just as a slight sidebar here, we're, we're, we're kind of circumambulating some core topics One that's worth reinstating here that I alluded to earlier in terms of the spectrum of identity, this is quite important. Like I alluded to, we don't just have a mind where it's, it's a society of mind. We have minds that arise moment to moment based on causes and conditions and all kinds of marvelously complex processes. And and let me just give you a little example. This, this, um, this spectrum of identity occurs across at least two vectors, probably even three, you know, good old X, Y axes. Where, where we have a particular developmental um, dimension of our being that is, is in, in the Western world, you know, the integral approaches work with this very beautifully, the kind of uh, structures of consciousness going from really low-based infrared, highly selfish to really quite evolved selfless states. And, and we've had hundreds of developmental scholars and researchers from anthropology, developmental psychology, all over the place, really articulate this transculturally all over the world, undisputed. So that's one vector of this, of what's called the, um, well, you know, they talk about it, John Well would use the term vertical, horizontal, the difference between vertical and horizontal enlightenment. Um, our mutual friend, Ken Wilber got this from, um, um, oh, what's his name, John? The guy, the spiritual bypassing guy, what's his name? Yeah, oh, right, I'm forgetting his name. He'll come to me in a second. Um, yeah. So he, he came up with this idea of, of, of waking up, the two paths of waking up versus growing up. 
And, and the reason I say this is because it's important. So you can have an experience. Well, let me say about the, the, grow, the waking up state. So the growing, the growing up state is classical kind of Western developmental approaches. The waking up state is a little bit more Eastern. And this is what we were talking about earlier is these three classic states of consciousness, right? That's the more waking up vector. Then there's the growing up vector. And so our identity, as you know, Zubin, it, it, it's fluid along those two axes. We're always moving moment to moment. Someday, you know, I can be a total schmuck. And then five minutes later, I can be a pretty selfless kind of loving person. Like, what's going on there? Talk, well, talk to my wife. She'll, she'll, yeah. she'll point right at that phenomenon. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so there's this fluidity of identity that's taking place. And so the reason this comes to mind is when you're having this dream, there was a higher frequency of your being kind of coming back in perhaps saying, hey, wait a second, you may want to think twice about engaging in that type of activity is a, is a kind of, a, I wouldn't say policing, that sounds a little bit too heavy handed, but just some kind of restraining order. You know, it's interesting. Every world's religion, right? Until ego is transcended, it needs to be restrained. Every world religion has its host of restraining orders, regulatory agencies. And so perhaps in one respect, that's what happened to you in that dream. Um, but what I, what I did want to say here in relation to something you were alluding to just a few minutes ago is that one of the great dreams, uh, results of, of dream yoga is in fact extrapolating the insights, as you were pointing out, from the nocturnal arena and then bringing them back into the waking state. So in Buddhist languaging, they talk about the nighttime dream, very interesting language, as the double delusion or the example dream. Whoa, that, what does that imply? Well, that implies that this is the real delusion, the real dream. And so this is the bi-directional genius of this practice. What you do in the nocturnal arena, that doesn't just stay tucked under the blankets of the night. No, you take these insights, you bring them back with you into the day, and you start to apply what you learned in the laboratory of the night to your daytime experience. And the way this works, here's one of many examples. So in, in classic stage three dream yoga, what you do is of, of nine stages. So let's say in this stage, stage three, you wake up in a dream, you're lucid, and you're dreaming. Let's say I'm dreaming right now, and, and there's a pen in front of me. And so I'm in the dream, and I say to myself in the dream, I want to change this pen into this bottle of water or whatever. It doesn't matter. Like whatever appears in the dream, I'm going to change this object into some other object. For listeners who have moments of lucidity, I suggest you try this. It's not as easy as you think because your habit patterns are revealed. You know you're dreaming. You still have this history that's, that, that reifies the, the pen, even in the dream. It's not as easy as it thinks, but as you think. But eventually, when you do it, you gain proficiency. The other one I love to do is I used to do the Carlos Castaneda thing, you know, raise your hand kind of thing. Um, and by the way, we can talk about this. There's actually no hand in there to raise. The hand is generated in the act of looking, but that's a sidebar. There's no hand. <laughs> There's no hand to look at. You generate it in the act of looking, but that's a different story. So I bring up the hand and I say, okay, I want to add another finger here. I do this all the time. So I want to add a, a sixth finger or whatever. And it's like, you know, I've done it long enough where I can do it with some facility, but at first I couldn't do it at all. And then when I was learning this stuff, it was like, okay, like, why am I doing this? Is this just like some weird video game thing? But then I realized the genius of it and the way it started translating to me. And it still works this way for me, Zoom in, is I'll be in a conversation with my partner or ex-boss or something. It's not going the way I want. Energy of anger is starting to come up. I'm starting to like get really pissed off. And I can feel myself about to hit a flashpoint of what? Total non-lucidity, where that energy is just going to steal my awareness. And something from last night's stupid dream of changing this pen into this plastic bottle of water will pop into my head and say, wait a second. I can transform. This anger isn't real. This anger is as real as that pen last night. I can take this anger just like I took that pen last night and transform it into kindness. And this is enormous. It's like what Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, one of the great, wonderful uh, Bun Buddhist masters who writes on this a lot, wonderful kind of maxim around this is beautiful. He says in, in relation to dream yoga, one of the fruitions is to come to this conclusion. This is a dream. 
I am free. I can change. I mean, that alone is colossal. This is a dream. This world is not as solid as you think. Your mind and your reality is made out of plastic. It's not a reified materialistic thing. It's made out of mind, heart, spirit. This is a dream. I'm free. I can do what I want in a dream. I can change. And so all these ways that we, that we limit ourselves by reifying our habit patterns, by falling into these poverty mentalities, these victim strategizes, strategies, oh, I can't do anything, I'm whatever. Listen to those narratives. Don't buy into them. Let them go and realize, no, 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 no. I have tremendous power and freedom. I can you know, virtually do anything I want with my mind and heart to change the way I relate to the world and to others. So, whoa, that's no small thing. I mean, that's a pretty good pitch, right? That's the end of suffering, more or less. Not just for you. It's it's a bodhisattva thing, like people around you. Uh, you know, you're talking about, you know, if you're arguing with a partner or something and you can transmute that, like you remember from your dream yoga practice where you're doing this, uh, I mean, that's transformative. and. You know, it, it made me think of something in, because I'm a hospital medicine doctor. So I take care of very sick, often older patients in hospital. And what we often see is this thing called delirium, where the waking state is perturbed by a waxing and waning of attention, uh, perceptual disturbances, inability to orient and so on. And patients will often describe it afterwards. And this goes also with ICU psychosis, which we saw rampant during COVID. This idea that the waking state bleeds into a dream state and it's dysphoric, it's a nightmare uh, because again, there's no lucidity and there's uh, uh, identification with form. And when you say form, you're talking about appearances in general, anything, thought, uh, sensation, emotion, uh, s- s- things that we see out there, visual stuff, auditory stuff, all form. Uh, and, and it's so, it, it creates grooves, almost these kind of karmic grooves that when people leave, and I did a show with Dr. Wes Ely about this, who, who's an expert in this ICU doc, talking about how do you deal with post-ICU syndrome? Um, how, how, you know, how does that relate to what we're talking about here in terms of work on the dream? You know, can, because we see this can damage people. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, you know, isn't it interesting, Zubin, that it has a lot, what we're talking about here absolutely positively has applicability to what you're alluding to there. Um, and, and these are um, interesting kind of liminal experiences. And so here's a brief interjection to, I mentioned, I intimated that the five nocturnal meditations, I haven't really mentioned them all. Let me just ping those out real quick. So we have some orienting generalization here um, and you'll see how this fits in. So the first practice is liminal dreaming. I'm going to talk about that like right now. The second one is lucid dreaming. That's when you classically, you wake up to the fact that you're dreaming and you remain in the dream, a metacognitive state. Tons to say about that. And the next one, um, they are progressive, is more refined lucid dreaming. I'm sorry, dream yoga, which is where basically, like we've been talking about, we can say, in, just for terms of contradistinction, lucid dreaming is more psychological and orient, uh, orientation, more about self-fulfillment. Fantastic, powerfully a beautiful set of practices with so many benefits. Dream yoga is more spiritual in nature and not so interested in self-fulfillment, more interested in self-transcendence. So it's more spiritual than psychological. Then the fourth practice, you'll find this in both Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, it's called sleep yoga or luminosity yoga. This is where you maintain, as we were suggesting earlier, as outrageous as it may appear, but scientists are working on that and if people can do it, you maintain lucidity in the deep dreamless state. The last practice is what's called bardo yoga, B-A-R-D-O in in Tibetan. The word means gap, transitional process in between. This is the dream at the end of time. So if you want to go to this deep end, if you believe in this sort of stuff, you don't have to. This is where you can use dream principles to help you prepare to die. And so the first one is of interest here, uh, Juman, because liminal dreaming, liminality is a really interesting principle. Previously, uh, I like the term liminality for the reasons I'll mention in a second. Previously, this was known as hypnagogic, hypnopompic states. Those pre and post dream states, hypnos meaning sleep or the god of sleep, um, gogic and pompic means leading towards or leading away from sleep. And so these are these wonderfully delicious states where you fall down when your head hits the pillow before you fall asleep. 
you know, going through one, two, three stages, sleep, as you know, all kinds of interesting things. And when you engage in liminal dreaming, this is what you can explore. It's kind of exploring the plasma of the mind, the froth of perception, where you're not quite here, you're not quite there. That's what liminal liminal um, beings are, LGBTQ, liminal experiences, liminal spaces, heterotopia, Michel Foucault talked about that. Wonderful dimensions of experience, physicality, where you're not quite here, you're not quite there, you're not awake, you're not asleep, you're not dead alive. And so for a person like that, the ICU um, experience or whatnot, that's what's taking place. The person is in a liminal space where their consciousness is dancing between these different bandwidths of um, waking and dreaming. And, and so it's because of the person's inability to ride that uh, experience without being thrown by it, that's what makes it dysphoric instead of euphoric. And so if you're working with things like liminal dreaming and even obviously deeper um, like nocturnal meditations, then when these types of experiences actually happen, again, talk about cash value, instead of freaking out because why you've lost your reference points, that's why these people are freaking, they're grounding like what happened to me in my two-week experience. Their, their reality is being pulled out from underneath them. And so they're freaking. And so if you have the ability to be liminal, to, to hang out in these threshold dimensions, instead of freaking out, you celebrate it. It's, the Sanskrits, uh, Sanskritists have a very interesting term. It's called chamatkara, which literally means this attitude of wonderment and amazement. And so when things are going to hell in a handbasket or your mind is just all over the place, instead of the usual, oh, crap relationship, it turns into an oh, wow relationship. So... How do we work with it in that capacity? Well, you can't necessarily take these types of practices and bring them to immediately apply them at clinical value in a situation like that. But what they can do is they can inform you that this is where this person is sliding up and down these different bandwidths of awareness. And therefore, a greater sense of perhaps, you know, this is the scientist, you and greater sense of understanding and compassion and holding environments that can be, can be created from that. That that that's that's wonderful. I love that idea of liminal space and that that kind of um, gap there between wakefulness and dream and that that fluctuating consciousness that feels very correct in applied to that. And it's interesting if, if you imagine if everybody was a a dream yoga practitioner and was actually familiar with the the metacognition necessary the the awareness of of that state so that you go from an oh crap to an oh wow and then they're put in a hospital and something like that and they they come with that perspective might it be different you know and one one anecdote that i have that happened to me recently that was uh, kind of remarkable I, I i we sleep my wife and i sleep with a noisemaker in the room that creates this white noise because my wife in particular is quite sensitive to uh sound and and things will wake her up so the noise provides a blanket. I was dreaming and only recently have I started to actually have more stable, more awareness of stability of dreams and dream recall after actually listening to your book. I pay attention now and crazy things have started to happen where I'm remembering dreams that are totally nuts. Like last night, I'll tell a story, but, but what had happened was I was dreaming and then I felt myself lying flat and rising through levels of awareness and like a fader, like you mentioned before, levels of consciousness in the East being more like a fader, like a fader, I heard the noisemaker fade up into awareness from nothing into awareness. And then my eyes opened and I was awake and I was completely aware of the, of the rise from the dream state to the waking state. And that noisemaker was like the cue, was the, was the sign that, that I had arrived back at wakefulness. That is so cool. And so, oh, geez. So here's, here's a way you can take that even one step further. I mean, that's awesome. So, so I talked uh, at the outset somewhere in our conversation about the, the primary primordial causal state of consciousness being deep, deep formless state, Turiya in, in the Hindu schools. And, um, and then how that from that arises epigenetically, epiphenomenally, the dream state from that condenses, reifies, arises this. And so the way this applies one step deeper to even what you said, it's exactly in resonance with this, but this will give you something to play with later, is that when you have, so we'll, we'll go to the fruitional aspect here. So when you have the experience of lucid sleep, people go, okay, well, that sounds good. Well, like, why do it? Well, 
number of amazing reasons. One is this extraordinary restorative capacity, um, kind of lubrication of, of the of the awakened mind. But the second thing that that takes place with this practice, completely resonant with what you're talking about here, is that when you have the experience of lucid sleep, lucid dreams arise automatically, naturally. And so this is why in the Nyingma tradition of, of Tibetan Buddhism, sleep yoga is the main practice. Because if you can do sleep yoga, you automatically have lucid dreams. And so the way this ties in um, to what you're saying is, so you, you can have, and, and the reason I mentioned this, because you'll see how this works both ways in a bi-directional way. You're in an experience of lucid sleep. You can bring that lucidity with you. You wake up, the dream automatically lucid. You are automatically aware of the dream being a dream. But here's where it gets really cool. Then you bring that, it's like you, you turn that light, night, night light is turned on. It's actually always on. That night light is turned on. You bring it with you. That brings up a lit dream. That's a lucid dream. It's lit. You're aware. Then what do you do? You bring it up one more dimension to this. You bring that same light with you now into this state. What's the result of that? Perfectly pure, loose reform. So we briefly pinged on that an hour ago. Now that comes back into play because now you see the world. You wake up, not just the dream that's lucid, this becomes lucid. Lucid dreaming, lucid sleeping leads to lucid living. Well, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, it means exactly what we talked about earlier. You no longer see the world dualistically. You no longer reify this world into self and other. There's no longer externality at all. You see the world the way the Buddhas do as a manifestation of mind as a dream. And okay, cash value for that. Well, in addition to everything else I just mentioned in terms of tremendous simplification and, and, and uh, reduction of your own personal suffering, spontaneous, selfless love and compassion. Because from that space, there is no sense of other. It's a complete experience of non-duality. And therefore, when you look out upon another, they are not perceived as other. They are perceived as self. And then from that experience, what naturally arises from that wisdom stance unconditional love and compassion. And your life then becomes a spontaneous expression of selfless service for the benefit of others. And so it's incredibly powerful taking these practices, bringing a light of lucidity with you all the way up into this state. Then you can do it the other way. This is where the practices come in. So during the day, you work with meditation, you work with the practice of a loose reform, doing some of the stuff we were talking about earlier with your eyes and blinking as a way to de-reify this world. What happens then? The classic bi-directional process that infiltrates back down, that brings about a heightened sense of lucidity in the dream state. Hence, more meditators have more lucid dreams. Even with more proficiency, more refined practices, then you do the same thing. You use your lucid dreams as a halfway house. And then you can use that as a platform then to drop into lucid sleep. And therefore, every single light, you see this dance taking place. Then when you wake up, you say every single arising, abiding, and cessation of thought abides by this phenomenology. And then if you want to believe it or not, the arising, abiding, cessation of every life takes place in this iterative fashion. And so this, again, has so much explanatory power in terms of how the mind plays out in in all these different dimensions and also a lot of um, street value. I mean, this stuff really, really has traction. Man, I, I I love it, and and so let me <laughs> let me loop you back in where I derailed you earlier. You were talking about the diff, the five different uh, levels of this, and the one is the liminal, the second is the lucid dream, yeah, and the third is what uh, dream yoga, the fourth is sleep yoga, and the fifth is bardo yoga. So. Lucid dreaming then is where you are, you're aware that you're dreaming. And by the way, I got to just tell one story because part of your, part of your uh, practices, which by the way, I really recommend people read your books or listen to them on audiobook because you go through, there's a workbook you have, there's all kinds of stuff like, how do you do this? We'll, we'll talk about some of it, but it, it deserves a lot of attention because there's so many practices that you may find, like you said, if you like some, they work for you great. If you don't, you throw them out. Um, the idea that you're just at first trying to stabilize these kind of liminal and standard dreams where you're just even remembering what you're dreaming because otherwise it's just like a froth of activity and you don't remember a lot of it. So you there are these practices to actually either wake yourself up with an alarm so that you correspond to the REM sleep cycle and you write down in a journal what you're dreaming. So I, I, I'm not very diligent. So what I did was I listened to you and I said, he's telling me I need to remember dreams. So I'm gonna at least set an intention, which is key, 
when I go to bed and I'm gonna try to remember dreams. And so it's been happening. So this morning, just for you, I, I had a dream that um, I think happened at the peak REM dream prime time, as you call it, like about an hour or two before I actually woke up for the day. And listen to this, um, and this has nothing to do with anything, just how crazy my mind is. I was given by somebody a seat from a Tesla, a white leather seat with no car. They gave it to me and said, this thing's really cool. You can drive around in it. And I was remember thinking, what? I sat in the seat and it had a remote control and I was on suddenly on a road and I was remote controlling myself in the seat and I felt the road under my butt and I was zooming around and I started to have a little panic, like, oh my God, I, this is probably illegal what I'm doing and I'm gonna get pulled over by a cop. And also I don't have my GPS, so I don't even know where I am. And what if I run out of battery and I'm in the middle of nowhere? And then the next thing I knew, I was at a hotel. I'd pulled into a hotel apparently, but it was discontinuous. So suddenly I'm in a hotel and the hotel is full and I have a dog. I don't own a dog and this dog is on me. And, and I, I was like, this dog seems like it wants something. It's whining, it wanted to go pee, but the hotel was full. So I started to panic like this dog's gonna pee in the hotel and it went on and on and on. Now, I have not been able to remember dreams in that level of detail for years probably, but just pointing out, like intersecting with your world, even in a small way, set the intention. And now it's possible for me, which means for people out there who think I can't even undergo this process, I can't, I don't even dream. They, there's hope <laughs> you can do it. If someone is, is chaotic mind like mine. Oh, absolutely. They can do it. I mean, we, unless you have very rare, unusual organic brain um, dysfunctions, everybody dreams. We have at least, as you know, four to five REM cycles every night. Not all dreams occur in rapid eye movement sleep, most, but not all. And so we dream whether we know it or not. And when we work with intentionality, um, induction method practices, meditation altogether, we are really just cultivating our capacity to, to develop this type of dream recall. And it's, it's, it's really interesting here, um, Jimin, because memory is another way to talk about a, a, a lucid, non-lucid dream is a non-lucid dream is a forgotten dream. In other words, it's a dream where you forget that you're dreaming when you're dreaming. A lucid dream in that regard is a remembered dream where you remember that you're dreaming while you're dreaming. And so memory is, is a capacity we can exercise, just like going to the gym and doing curls for your biceps. You can absolutely positively through exercises, what are called prospective memory exercises, which are exercises to remember to do something in the future, i.e. have a lucid dream. That's, that's a pr type of pr prospective memory. Meditation itself, literally, sati um, um, in Pali and uh, drempa in Tibetan, the word literally means to recollect, to remember. Memory is huge. And so we start with relatively entry-level practices to develop dream recall. Then what we'll discover is that our capacity to recall and to open to states of mind increases. And therefore, these, these small little moments of success are, are key where we can celebrate, just like you said, like, whoa, I, I wasn't been able to do that before. No, I'm actually bringing the light of awareness into previously um, secretive domains. It's like consciousness hacking. You know, you're, conscious, you're hacking into previously secretive domains of consciousness. And so dream induction methods, intentionality, cultivated prospective memory exercises, all the things that you generously refer to in my books. Everybody listening here, I promise you, if you engage in these practices, you can absolutely positively have these types of dreams. And then they develop it. It has this kind of positive feedback loop thing takes place and you, you, you it feeds on itself and you start to see how it affects you in your life. And then like I talked about earlier, all these other wonderful collateral benefits start to cascade from that. So that's awesome. It's, it, it's interesting too. I want to say one thing about the relationship between lucid dreaming and dream interpretation. They're not the same thing. Um, dream interpretation versus lucid dreaming dream yoga is a little bit like the relationship between therapy and meditation. Now, this doesn't in any way diss dream interpretation. I'm a huge fan of it. I do it all the time. Dream interpretation is colossally important, but it's a different bandwidth of applicability to the dream state. It's a little bit like when you're in meditation, you don't care about dream content like you were in therapy. You care about transforming your relationship to that content. So I throw that into the mix because people often wonder, well, geez, you know, Zubin had a really interesting dream. What does that mean? Well, 
it can mean whatever it is. There's ways to talk about dream interpretation. But that's just a different bandwidth of applicability. But the cool thing is when you're working with the lucidity principle, that's what it is. Lucidity is code word for awareness. You will start to notice that your awareness, like light itself, it's very difficult to contain light. Light leaks. And so you start to notice how this light starts to infiltrate not just your nocturnal mind, but as I was mentioning earlier, this light starts to spread to your entire life. And it's absolutely central to this beautiful term in English we call enlightenment. It's absolutely connected to all that. So anyway, pretty cool that, stuff, my friend. I'm that's sure. awesome. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna take what you just said and I'm gonna I'm gonna double down. Okay. Because that that dream I just described to you was the dream I had last night that I recalled and I gave to you just now. When we first connected by email and I heard the podcast that you were on, which I'll I'll link to as well, um it it, it it again incepted something in my mind. So I started thinking a lot about lucid dreaming and so on. Well, I had a really interesting deeper dream experience that I would love to get your impression on because I think people have these. Yeah, so I was uh, I was asleep, presumably. And now this was not, I was not lucid in this dream to the extent that I knew I was dreaming. And in fact, I would say that this felt as real as anything, maybe hyper real. So more real than waking reality. And there was a figure there, a male figure with a beard who was chanting in a language that was vaguely, sounded vaguely ancient. I couldn't quite understand it, but it definitely was in English and was chanting. There was another figure here watching this. And I was sitting next to the figure who was lying down like this. And there was an energy coming off this figure. And uh, again, I'm not doing this justice because it was hyper real and very otherworldly. And uh, and so real and otherworldly at the same time, paradoxically. And he's chanting. And for some reason, I'm looking at the other figure who's watching. I felt compelled to put both my legs and my hands down from whatever perch I was on, onto this figure's chest and just lay them there. And at that point, I had an energetic sensation of like all this energy coming from the figure, coming through my body, my body turning completely transparent, like a Kundalini type energetic experience coming out the top and just very, almost unbearably powerful. And then I remember opening my eyes and being in my room in the dark, but completely unaware that, okay, what was I dreaming? I don't even know. And still the energy coming through the body, the lightness, the transparency and all of that. And then finally turning my head to look at the clock and seeing that it was it was exactly 90 minutes after I went to sleep that I was awake and having this experience. And then I, I, I was very, I was like, oh, wow, I got it. This one's hard to forget. Yeah. And I went back to sleep. Yeah. So curious what you think. <laughs> well, no, well, a number of things. Um, first of all, the 90 minute number is very interesting because as you know, um, cycles tend to occur in these 90 minute um, patterns as you know, right? We cycle through one, two, three, four, five is the dream, then pop back through. So that's one thing that's very interesting. The second is um, when we're working with the, the dream mind, it is supported by <clears throat> the subtle dream body. Now, the, the, the subtle dream body is, is a, this is a multivalent term. Um, subtle body in the, in the dimension I'm going to be talking about is going to be more applicable um, in, in a second, subtle body, one definition of subtle body is actually the dream itself. That's a subtle form. That's a subtle body. So there's a phenomenological subtle body. I want to be talking a little bit about the relationship between that experience of the subtle phenomenological body and the subtle physiological body, because that is the body, the inner yoga body. So in, in most of the world's wisdom traditions, I don't know them all, but I know a fair number of them. There's outer body and outer yogas that work with that body, go to any street corner, hatha yoga, they're all great. They work with that. Many of these schools, but not all of them, will, will honor and acknowledge that there's also a subtle inner body that, by the way, Eastern medical systems target that body for health. Why? Because the outer body is a phenomenal expression of that subtle body, right? So when you're doing acupuncture, moxibustion, and the like, why does it work? Well, one reason it works is because you're working with a substrate of the physical soma. And so when you're involved <clears throat> doing dream yoga, it's a subtle body yoga, whether you know it or not. You're engaging. And in, in, in fact, the inner tantric induction methods work with that subtle body. 
So the reason I mentioned this is when you have that experience and you feel that energy coming up, the Kundalini or in prana lung chi, whatever term you want to use it, that's legitimate subtle body electricity. That's why the dream felt more, it felt hyper real because it was actually electrified dream from the prana energy. That's what made it so vibrant. And so when that actually entered probably your central channel, came up through the channel, lit you up, woke you up, you felt it in the waking state. It's because that energy is then infused from the subtle body into the gross body. And so it changes your, your gross body. You feel lighter, you feel freer, you wake up tingling, almost buzzing with this experience you had in the dream state. And then this can become so powerful that um, it can affect your entire day. And so this also, just to tie in some threads that we've been exploring, we talked about meditation as habituation to openness. This is not just kind of mental, cognitive, um, heady openness. It, it actually works with opening your subtle body. And so when you're engaging in these practices, habituation to openness means you're also opening the energy configurations in your subtle body. And so we can say more about that in terms of technicalities of practice, but that's where mind go, my mind goes with your dream is that the dream was hypercharged, hyper lucid, because you were really kind of plugging into the direct current of the subtle body. It infused you when you woke up into this soma because they're, they're not two separate things. And therefore your entire body was, was it's called lungta. Your wind was raised, your wind horse was raised, your energy was raised. And so therefore this is another thing you can do with these practices. Um, you can enter these states and then come out of them and your entire body is reconfigured and opened and freer and lighter. And I would suspect when you woke up that it felt that way. It felt freer, open, lighter because the channel systems had, had actually opened. And so we mentioned earlier, to tie in yet another thread, we talked about this notion of neuroplasticity. The subtle body channel system, the terms are called nadis, N-A-D-I, that's what the channels refer to. I playfully talk about this phenomena as nadi plasticity, where the channels themselves then, the knots open, the chakras release, the energy opens, and then you feel it as this energy suffuses through you. So that's what comes to mind. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. You know, it's so funny. It's so funny, Andrew. Like I, I, I'm a hardcore skeptic, scientific type of background guy, you know, grew up fairly strongly atheist and, 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 you know, would have made fun of anyone who used the term chakra or energy or prana or any of this stuff. And I, I will tell you having, again, it's all philosophy and woo woo until you experience it, until you embody it, then, then you're like, no, that shit's real. I don't know what it is. You can describe it the ways that you do. And that's great. And that's actually helps me as someone who needs that structure, but it's real. And that's not the first time I've had that experience. I've had it in waking during a uh, meditation retreat, same thing, Kundalini type opening, channels open and everything changes. You're, you're blown wide open. It's almost like all the, all the compassion and suffering in the world are intertwined and they're coming through you. And it's, it's you know, even when I talk about it, I embody it <laughs> like this, like the body starts to move. Wait, look at your gesture. Exactly. Opening. It is. It, 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 it feels like that. And so I think to the audience members that I think are, they're understandably skeptical of this stuff. Honestly, you don't have to believe anything. Just go through these different practices as you're inclined to do and experience what you experience. I couldn't agree more. And, and this is where I think we do. We also have a level of, of, of uh, further confluences because I was the same with you. I was brought up in a scientific medical community, my family. I study physics. I, you know, I, I still adore science. I think science is amazing. Parenthetically, science is not the problem. Scientists are the problem. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> Science is beautiful. And so one of the reasons I'm so connected to the Buddhist thing is um, I don't think it's legitimate. Evan Thompson really kind of uh, rightly said you really can't talk about Buddhism as a science of mind. I think that's actually true. But it is scientific in the sense that it's empirical, in the sense that you test things. I mean, even the Buddha allegedly said, um, do not accept my teaching at, at face value. Test them against, against your own experience. Work out your own salvation with diligence. And so like you, I maintain, you know, my challenge is because of my academic scientific background, I feel myself contracting. You know, people listening might think, well, this guy's like a woolly. No, no. I, I feel myself contracting against these kind of principles when I first came across them. And I realize, you know, on one level, it's it's testing my contractive tendencies. It's expanding, it's inviting me to open my aperture of awareness. And so a, a playful way to, to work with this that I like is it's really important 
to have an open mind. But if your mind is too open, your brains are going to fall out. So, so <laughs> I love openness, but I'm also really great with agnostic. I'm, I'm very comfortable saying, I don't know. And I'm also willing to take whatever somebody tells me, and I'm just going to test this. I'm going to test it against my experience. Um, you know, it's like, here's the hypothesis. There's this thing called enlightenment. Here's the experiment. It's this thing called meditation. I'm going to go into a retreat for three years to see if I follow this experimental protocol that I can experience this thing called enlightenment. And hey, you go in there, you do what they tell you, you have these experiences and you go like, holy shit, there's something going on here. And then, you know, you just drink a little bit more of the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and you test it, you test it, you test it. And I, for all the listeners here, especially in this day and age, oh my gosh, test the teacher, test the community. Don't be afraid to ask the hard questions, take them to the carpet. If there's any resistance to anybody not wanting to go here, run in the other direction. Because very briefly, and this is worth throwing just very briefly into the next Zubin, is this is where all the crap show scandals take place. And they're never going to stop because people, like I mentioned earlier, you can have a, a really high level state experience. It's not even stable. It's an experience. It's not realization. It's not even stable. You have a high level state experience. Unless you remain totally silent. The minute you open your mouth, you have no choice but to express your state experience through a structure of consciousness. And this is where the shit show starts. <laughs> Somebody has a total, I mean, I, no doubt. They experience the Dharmakaya, they experience Turiya, no doubt. But then they have an infrared level of developmental awareness. They're still stuck at that level. And the kicker is these are phenomenologically invisible. You don't see, you don't look at these things, you look through them. So these are the archetypal blind spots. And this is where you get all these meditation masters who totally legitimate, 100%. They have a legitimate experience. It's not even stable. Experience. They download it, translate it into their structural level of development. You get patriarchy. You get power abuse. You get the entire crap show that will never stop until these Eastern people realize that they don't have all the eggs here. There's these developmental levels that their phenomenology and their methods do not even access. These are archetypal blind spots and they are causing and will continue to cause a heap of hurt because it's not an integral approach to psycho-spiritual development. They're woke up, wake up, you can't say woke up. They've, the good news of waking up, not a lot of growing up. And then you get what you're seeing in the world today. You, you, that, that's a thousand percent correct. The lines and levels of development, you can wake up to certain realization. And like you said, it's not, it's not necessarily realization. They've had these gl either glimpses or real experiences of all those aspects of that spectrum. But then they come back, bring it to their level of development and it supercharges their spiritual ego that now exists. And, 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 and you know, honestly, Andrew, if I'm being very introspective, this is a huge risk in my line of work because I'll go on a retreat, I'll have these experiences, I'll come back and I want to share them with everybody, but I don't necessarily have the stable realization or the perspective or, and I've got my own baggage psychologically. And so it can become weaponized in a way that's not productive for others. So I'm always trying to, and like you said, you're seeing through this lens. So it's a blind spot. That's where, you know, therapy or personal growth or whatever you're doing in conjunction, that integral approach is key. Marrying East and West and 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 having all those aspects in your tool belt, I think is is very important. Cannot be overstated. Cannot be overstated. It's unbelievably important. And, and it will really save you. And I, and I speak from my own experience. I, I was involved in communities. They were a little bit less than ideal. And there's just been a tremendous amount of, of, of pain and devastation because of people under, not being able to understand these things. And so there's blind spots east and west. And I, as a, as a, as a practitioner and, and a pretend teacher now and again, I mean, one of my biggest things is what am I not saying? You know, where, where are my blind spots? And this is why I love talking to people like you. I love talking to um, Islamic, Jewish, Hindu. I don't care where they come from. Other traditions, I love engaging in debate and honest cross-pollination between these things because it's so easy to kid yourself around this stuff. And so therefore, um, yeah, uh, what is it? What did, what did Josh Billing say? It's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you do know that just ain't so, right? <laughs> your, all your axiomatic <laughs> givens, all these blind spots. And so, yeah, 
This le, 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 and relating to that, that's beautiful. I mean, relating to that, let me ask a question because I was talking about my portion of my audience that's very skeptical, maybe atheist, very science-minded. There's also a big portion of my audience that's devoutly Christian or Jewish, et cetera. How do you talk? Because a lot of times I'll get comments back when I'm talking about this kind of stuff and they'll say, you know what? There's one answer. It's Jesus Christ. He's our Lord and Savior. That's that. How, how do you integrate this sort of path with the Christian um, sort of theology and mysticism and so on? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, well, you know, this is again where, where understanding developmental levels of psychospiritual um, growth in, uh, come into play because I completely 100% abide by the Christ principle in the same way that I abide to the Muhammad principle in, in the irreducible expression of these you know, awakened beings. But there are, uh, especially if we're speaking very specifically about Christianity, it, it would depend on the bandwidth in the school from which that person is coming from. So the first thing that I would do if I was engaged in the conversation is simply just listen and try to meet the person where they're at. That's the first thing is opening, opening, and is an exercise. It, it, it's a wonderful way of using dialogue as path, feeling the contraction where you have your answer formulated before they've even done speaking, feeling the way you're becoming defensive or offensive based on your ideologies. And for me, it's, it's an exercise of staying open, meeting people, that's to me, the definition of skillful means, upaya, it's not meeting people where they're at, uh, where you're at, meeting people where they're at. So first thing I do is really listen. And then to the best of my ability, I, I try, I have no choice, right? I have no choice, but to relate and refer that experience to my frameworks. And then I see whether there's resonance or rub. And if there's resonance, then you and I are nodding our heads and we can give each other hugs and we're on the same path. But a lot of times I pay attention to the rubs. I, I actually like the friction because that's what creates the pearl. It's like, well, wait a second. Okay, well, all right. I may not agree with that. Why don't I agree with that? Why, why am I not resonant with that? So very specifically, I, I have tremendous resonance with the Gnostic traditions, the Gnostic schools, so-called esoteric Christianity. Um, it, it speaks to me more than uh, more overt aspects of the tr Christian tradition. As I've practiced them, I was raised as a Catholic. I grew up as a Catholic. I was an altar boy. I did the whole thing. It was fantastic. It was beautiful. But just like there can be, we talked briefly about the developments, just like you can have, um, there's so much to say here, but I think Carl Beck is probably one of the most um, articulate exponents of these different levels using a color schema whether, rather than a, a, a name schema. Because like Gene Gebser, the great anthropologist, he would talk about archaic, magic, mythic, rational, pluralistic, integral. That's great. Fantastic. Not dissing it. But there's so much baggage associated with that. I like Carl's Beck or a part Carl Beck's work because he does the same thing, but he uses colors. And so then what I would say along those lines, there's a, there's a red Christ. In other words, there's a Christ that's interpreted at this level of development. There's a blue Christ. There's a green Christ. There's an ultraviolet Christ. There's a clear light Christ. And so there are different ways to interpret and relate to the Christ principle based on, on particular predisposition skill sets and developmental structures. And so that's the way I work with that, Ruben. Uh, Zubin. It's it's a great question. I'll pause to make sure that's even remotely what you're asking. No, that that, that that's right. And and it's more. And I want my audience to know that that are Christians that this material is not um, off limits for you. In other words, uh, it it can integrate with where you are in your own belief, in your own um, uh, practices. And many, many, many Christians who have been on retreat or have done other things like this, this is not a strictly Buddhist thing, right? It, it's accessible to those traditions. And so I don't want you to close the door to say dream yoga or lucid dreaming or the practice of awakening. And one thing I wanna double down on is this idea of color coding levels of development that it's, I think it's so fascinating. I think if we understood those, and I'll do another show on that at some point, that you know re the red power might is right stage versus the blue hierarchical, um, um, like almost like old school Catholic church model versus the orange capitalist meritocracy rationalist versus the green multicultural pluralistic where I think society right now is predominantly, that's why we're seeing the sort of shadow side of it now starting to emerge in like the wokeness and all the other stuff that kind of cancel culture. 
And the next level of, you know, the integral uh, teal, uh, it, it, where you are, and you may be at several levels depending on what you're talking about. And it's it's more like a wave than a level. And, and understanding that means you never, um, there's no, there's never a condescension. There's always an understanding. There's always an openness to uh, understand somebody where they are and recognize where you are too and what your own biases are. It, it, and I call that the alt middle. It's this like right. radical way of looking at things. Right. It's it's really trying to look from an integral lens at all the levels of development being true, but partial. Exactly. And, and the other thing that's really helpful is the difference between dominator and actualization hierarchies, because these things are, these, this implies a hierarchy. And most of us in the West, uh, when they hear that term, they, they, ah, hierarchies, you know, grading, and that's a dominator hierarchical approach. But there's actually actualization hierarchies. And this is, this is classic development with you and your children. You act as an actualizing hierarchical system with your kids. You represent that, that level. They're not going to go after you because that, because they realize you represent higher levels of development, literally physical, biological, and whatever. And so in exactly the same way, if we understand, if we have the humility, and again, ego gets, this is the rub. You know, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. I don't want, you know, whatever. Well, we have to realize when we look at the world, even when we're adult, there's a difference between a Hitler and the Dalai Lama, right? I'm sorry. There just is. And if we emulate one and not the other, we can employ the genius of the actualization hierarchies. And and again, it requires what? A degree of openness and humility. Hey, Maybe there's somebody who knows more than me, God forbid. I sure as heck hope so. I love talking to people that know a heck of a lot more than me that can teach me. A lot of people don't, right? I mean, I don't want to go into the whole political thing, but you reach a particular level and it's like, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Close, contracted, defensive, offensive, open, open. Oh, what can I learn from this person? What can they show me? What am I not seeing that they can reveal to me? And so therefore everything, every situation becomes a teacher in that regard, right? And, and remembering that each level has its shadow side and its problems, you know, like the the a perspectival madness of uh, a multicultural worldview where, well, every view is equal, like you said, but the Dalai Lama and Hitler are not, they're not on an actualization hierarchy. They're not equal. Um, they're at different levels of development and, and, and respecting and honoring that. Like you said, with a, with a lens of humility, which is, which is, um, Difficult when you have a blind spot to that. Uh, it, it, it can be difficult. Well, now, one thing, I, oh, go ahead. Let me say a thing, one, real quick a thing about that. One way you can tell that blind spot is through your uh, reactivity. In other words, there's this, a, a jingle in, in the traditions. If the situation affects you more than it informs you, you're probably dealing with a projection. So when you feel that reactivity, if something is affecting you more than it's informing you, there's, there's some projection going on. And so whenever that happens to me, it's like, well, why am I so reactive here? Wow, well, that's why, because these particular buttons are being pressed. Let's look at those buttons. Who installed them? I did, right? Why is this react? Why am I so reactive this way? And so then when my buttons are pressed, instead of acting from that, you know, sending the nuclear warhead from my side, don't press the button to send something, press the button to say, hey, wait a second, what did I just install? Why am I so bloody reactive here, right? And then humility, openness. So the idea here is replace reactivity with response ability, right? And then open. Anyways, I cut you off. I wanted to throw that in because I, I, think, I do think that's important because when we engage and I do this stuff, I love these kind of dialogues, cross-cultural, cross-religious dialogues. I really enjoy them. And I feel it within myself. I'm like, ah, oh, this is bullshit, you know? And I feel that contraction. I feel like, wait a second, why is it bullshit? Why, okay, own up to it. No, it's not bullshit. That's me making it bullshit. So I, I just think it's helpful for ending the culture wars and listening to each other. Because if we can't even do that, we don't stand a chance. Right? We don't stand a chance. <laughs> Exa- I'm really glad you you d- dived into that because that's exactly that. You know, my whole sort of. Uh, what I'm trying to cultivate, and again, I'm very, to say I'm imperfect <laughs> is a euphemism. I'm trying to cultivate this idea that, hey, you can actually find truth everywhere. We need to listen. We need to recognize our own triggers and our own biases. And like what you said, now I find as someone who measures very high on volatility on personality scores, I find that very often I'm, um, well, how did you describe it? You're, you're, reacting rather than informed. What was the terminology? Yeah, when, you're, when you're affected more than you're informed. That's a really that's very it. humbling. 
when you're- It is, it is. And I find that that's common for me. I'm often immediately affected by something. And then, but then it, because of the effort and the actual attention that I've tried to place on looking at that, I actually will catch it. It'll take a while sometimes, but I'll look inside and go, oh, there it is. It's triggering this anger is coming because it's a, it's a boundary violation that I'm perceiving because I never properly set the boundaries or I have this in, in correct perception of what a boundary is. And I feel like this person's stomping on it, taking advantage of me. It's unfair. I'm gonna react. I'm gonna launch the ICBMs and all of that. And then you start to realize, oh, okay, all right. You know, and, but that's, that's the work. That's the work. That's the work. And that's why they call it work because it goes against your habitual patterns. And it's, it's, um, it's no day at the beach. You know I mean? Real authentic spirituality is not about feeling good unless you're talking about basic goodness. It's about getting real. And so this is where as, as wonderful and cuddly, adorable as the new age is, I, I, I'm not categorically dismissing it. Um, this business is not about feeling good, it's about getting real. Because if it's only about feeling good and expanding your comfort plan, then what happens when you get sick, get old and die? What happens when, like what's happening in the world now, where does your spirituality go when the world is going to hell? Can you in fact bring your heaven into that hell? Now you've got industrial strength meditation. Now you've got industrial strength spirituality. Now you can really be a benefit to the world. So these are other factors I think we need to keep in mind. I think I think Nizargadatta said it. Um, I actually did a video on this. You know, we obsess with externalities and uh, feel that we're you know victimized by these outside forces. But reality, he said, don't forget about the reforms. Mind the reformer. When you when you turn inwards, then you're. Uh, your world actually changes. And, and it's not magical manifestation. It's just how reality happens to work. Um, so that's a beautiful way to think about current events and how we can actually help. People say, how can I help? It's like, dive in, do, do this work and watch the world improve around you. Watch your family you know, uh, change, watch everything change. Um, one thing you had said earlier in the thing, we, we you would you would do a meditation yeah, with us. Yeah. Are you still are you still oh, feeling up to that? It. Oh, totally. Yeah. Because because it, um, it's something that that I have found to be really compelling, provocative. Something that that people can take home with them, work with again and again. That um, it's reasonably accessible. I can guide you through it in four uh, four minutes or so. And I find that with repeated reflections on this, um, no small thing. So let, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. lovely. So let's let's just take a second. Um, you know, go ahead. I think it's easier at first to close your eyes. This is a kind of contemplation, analytic meditation. It's associated with the dream yoga tradition, but it's actually even a little bit bigger in scope. And so this is a way to explore your dreams, to bring to direct experience some of the material insights that we've been talking about. <clears throat> and so the contemplation is the following. First, simply bring to mind any dream. It, doesn't, it really just doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be lucid, just simply any dream. And to whatever extent works for you, try to basically re-enter that dream environment. Usually not terribly difficult. And you can say, yeah, there I am. Uh, it was such a great dream. I was on the beach in the Yucatan, drinking my margarita, watching the sunset. Such a great dream, doesn't matter. Now, when you're in the dream, there most certainly seems to be a dream appearance, the margarita, the sunset, the Yucatan beach, uncontested. Yes, I am seeing this dream. And also in an unexamined way, there seems to be a dreamer. I'm experiencing this dream. We say this colloquially. We wake up in the morning and even use even, oh, I want to share this dream. I had this dream. 
So in a somewhat unexamined way, there's this sense that, yes, I am experiencing this dream, right? You wake up the next morning, I had this great dream. But now let's take a closer look. From the perspective of the waking state, we can look back upon this exact same dream from this stance and glean some very interesting insights. From this stance, look back. Look back at the same dream, the Yucatan, the margarita, the sunset. Yes, that image is still there. Absolutely. Absolutely had the dream. There it is. There's the dream image. But now the investigation, and you hinted at this earlier, Zuma, is take a look at this assertion, this unexamined assertion that there's a dreamer. So from this perspective, even retrospectively, can you find the dreamer? Whoa. This gets a little bit more interesting and maybe even a little creepy. Look, can you find the dreamer? So in an unexamined way, <clears throat> there seems to be a dream, appearance, dream object, seems to dream, be, appear a dream subject, dreamer, and then by immediate implication, there seems to be a consciousness that connects the two. But this is an illusion, which you can see for yourself through this investigation. There is no dreamer. And there, are, there also, therefore, is no dream consciousness connecting the subject to the object. There's only the appearance of the dream. Whoa, wait a second. So what's actually taking place here? Exactly what you talked about Zubin a couple hours ago. The appearance in the dream knows itself. It's reflexively aware. It's self-illuminating. This is a glimpse into non-dualistic perception, non-dualistic knowing. Classically, when you see subject, object, and consciousness that connects, this is called threefold impurity. Threefold purity is, in fact, the dissolution the deconstruction of this unholy trinity, subject, object, consciousness. Consciousness does not connect. Consciousness separates. Wisdom connects. Let's take this and make it even more immediate. Okay, look at your mind right now. Bring to mind a thought, an image, doesn't matter. Let's just do it. Let's just say visualize, bring to mind an apple. Seems to be an apple out there, apple of my eye. Seems to be an experiencer. I am seeing this apple. Now, don't think brain, don't think body, think phenomenologically. Can you find the thinker? Look. Can you find the subject? Look. There isn't one. It's the lightning fast referencing contraction that we talked about earlier that takes place unbelievably quickly, so quickly 
It's as fast as you deriving meaning from the essential neutral sound waves that are impinging upon your ears. You bring meaning to these sound waves and hear words, meaning where there's essentially neutral sound. It happens virtually instantaneously. That's how fast this referencing takes place. That's how fast the ego is constructed. Moment to moment to moment. Last step, open your eyes. Look at whatever is in front of you. And ask yourselves exactly these same questions. Seems to be an object out there. I'm looking at a wall. Sure as heck seems that way. Seems to be a subject in here. Is it? Is there? So with repeated reflections on this double delusion, you can extrapolate, extend the same non-dual insights into this. Eventually waking up to this is the same status, ontological and epistemological status of your dreams. This is a dream. This is a manifestation of mind. Reflexively aware. So it's a rather deep dive into the deepest end of the pool, but this is something that can be done. You see, it didn't take that long. Do it again and again and again. And it's a little bit like what they say about quantum mechanics. If you're not shocked by the implications of quantum mechanics, you don't get it. This is a taste of emptiness. When you look and try to find the self, you will not find one. The self is empty of inherent existence, yet there's still something there. It's not nihilistic. There's still the radiance of appearance. What is that? That's this reflexive awareness. We can say, I'll, I'll pause before we go too far into that. What is actually that? You are that. Tat, tvam, asi. You don't see that. You are that. So when we talk about emptiness, which we haven't talked about overtly, is absolutely synonymous with non-duality. It's just the Buddhist way of talking about that. So I'll pause there, zoom in, and see if that has any traction, but I find this one to be relatively accessible and with repetition, rather compelling. Man, uh, it's hard to talk after something like that because it's such a direct pointing. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, such a beautifully direct pointing. I mean, it. it yeah, if I try to talk about it, it'll just, uh, it, it'll diminish it. So I will leave it for the viewers to go through that meditation again and again and again, and do it in your waking life, do it in your dreaming life, do it during meditation. That's a kind of self-inquiry. Where is this I that I think I am? And look, and keep looking, and keep looking, and keep looking, and this self-reflexive, radiant phenomenon that 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 make up our experience. I, I won't talk about it. You just have to explore. Exactly. And Ramana Man, Maharshi, that was Ramana Maharshi developed an entire his entire path was based on this query: Who am I? And you know, by asking that question, it will take you to the truth, away from fake news to real news. And the thing to emphasize that's so I think important here is this points out to you the utter immediacy of what it is that we're actually looking for. What we're looking for is hiding in plain sight. In fact, in in so many ways, a, a quality of path is antithetical to this, a path to where? Nowhere or now here. And so that's the other implication of this is, oh, maybe someday if I'm lucky, if I get all my ducks in a row, I'll get enlightened. No, you're already enlightened. You're already in a pure land. You're already in heaven, whatever term you want to use. The simple um, invitation is open, recognize, open, recognize. And then, then that's it. You know, you're out of a job. I'm out of a job. Everybody goes home, awakened Buddhas, recognizing themselves for who they really are. <laughs> And they wake up one day going, oh my God, can it really be this simple? Yes. Ah. 
you know, as long as I don't have to become vegan, I'm down with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So this is a great way to, to, to close because, oh my gosh, this stuff can get initially, it can seem so complicated. It can seem so oh, like, like, oh my gosh, there's just roadkill everywhere. The only reason this stuff can get a little bit complex is because we're complex. Ego structure is very complex. And so the Buddha taught the 84,000 dharmas, not because it's, it's 84,000 levels of, of complexity. No, the 84,000 teachings are designed to meet the complexity of the mind. Fundamentally, it's beyond simple. They say in the Mahamudra tradition, so obvious, we don't see it. So simple, we don't trust it. So easy, we don't believe it. Hiding in plain sight. And so again, this reflection can point out to you some incredibly profound truths that are really available to you. Emptiness is not that difficult to see. We just don't look. It's incredibly easy. And therefore, this can lead you to some very impactful immediate. And so I often say playfully, stop rescheduling your appointment with reality. Don't reschedule it. Be a Buddha now. Recognize now. It, 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 you know, it's like T.S. Eliot. You, you come around and see it as if for the first time. It's like, oh, my gosh. Holy crap. Can it really be this simple and this obvious and this easy? Yes. It, it, it's really funny, Andrew, because um, the egoic mind does come back during an experience like that. And it'll be like, oh, oh, that, that must have been it. You, you know, disappeared for a second. It's all just radiant this suchness. And um, I'll have to come back to that and really dig into that. And uh, I'm gonna tell my friends about that too, because that's a that's a thing. And uh, you know, I'm gonna read a book on that too. And, it, and grasping and grasping and trying to solidify something that's right here, right now, never left, immediately accessible. So that's the that can be the challenge, especially for people who are intellectually minded. Yeah. It's a real pitfall. Yeah, and then for those, <laughs> and I'm that same way, for those, um, every time you have that, you know, but I, what I talk about, there's a primordial contraction. So we're talking about really about the contraction. These contractions exist along a vast spectrum. And, and the most interesting one is the actual primordial contraction. Well, what does the primordial contraction feel like? Me. The very sense of I that I talked about earlier. That's the primordial contraction. So very, the very usage of the term, I'm going to come back to that. That's, a, that, that's already a referentiality. That's already a centricity, a contraction that takes in, that's taking place that is completely antithetical. And so therefore, once you're sensitized to this, what, what do you do? You just recognize that contraction. You breathe into it, you open. And so therefore, then all your contractions become opportunities for expansions. But anyway, your point mm. is really is, is well taken. Mm. Zoom in, so. mm. cool. That's beautiful. Ah, Andrew. Zoom in, been fun. Ah, I'm, I'm so grateful that you spent so much time with us teaching us. This was so wonderful. We didn't hit like 99.9% .9 of all the things that we could have hit. And yet I feel like I'm like, <sighs> so will you please uh, consider coming back? Oh, I love it. I, I love your energy. I love your passion. Um, you know, you're a deep diver and, it, it, you know, I, I love dialogue as path. I think this quality of sharing and this opportunity in these containers, these holding environments of, of community are really quite beautiful. And so it's a delight and honor really to spend time with someone of your capacities um, to talk about stuff that's really just so important, so meaningful. So it's a total delight for me. Anytime you want me, man, we'll do it again. I I, uh, I can't wait. And um, I will share links. Uh, what's your website again? Yeah, so I've got several. Uh, Andrew Holacek, H-O-L-E-C-E-K.com. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening there. And then I have another platform called Night Club, playfully appended which is uh, something that we came up with about three years ago to support people in the somewhat solitary journey of these nocturnal meditations. So we have like 3,000 um, members. It's a wonderful, rich discourse community with um, like a Facebook type thing where people just get together and chat, webinars, podcasts, all kinds of stuff. It's really rich. And so those are the two principal ways to kind of stay connected to the silliness that I do. So thanks for that opportunity. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, no, no, people should check out all your stuff. And if you wanna go deep on the stuff, definitely the books too are very, very helpful and you do seminars and all of that. Quick last question, because I know I brought up the movie a couple times, Inception. What were your yeah. thoughts on that movie? You well, know, it's interesting. It, it, to me, it's like, whatever gets the word out. You know, I mean, what you know what got me into the path, you know, I hate to say um, five decades ago, Kung Fu. 
I wanted to be like David Carradine. Heck yeah. I mean, you know, a little spiritual, kick a little ass. That's me. And so um, the inception is really interesting because it got lucidity out there a little bit. Um, the idea we can talk about later of, of recursive or nested dreams is inherent in that. Obviously, it got the prototypical Hollywood thing in it, but it's like, hey, if you can get people even talking about it and interested in it, like I mentioned earlier, I don't care what it is, right? And if Inception can do it, go for it, man, right? Yeah, cool. I love it. I love it. Plus, Leo DiCaprio, bro, come oh, he's on. He's a rock star. I love the guy. Yeah. yeah he's so <laughs> environmentally conscious. He's a real cool dude. So, yeah. Yeah, I like Leo. Um, all right, I think we did a thing. Thank you so much. Um, we'll put all the links in. We'll follow up. This will be on all the platforms shortly. And uh, I love you guys in the audience. Uh, we are out. Peace.